Okay, so welcome to the 74 Economic Policy Panel. Uh, there will be it's a two-day panel with uh, many nice papers presented, which are submitted to economic policy, and there is an invited session about uh, uh, finance, money, and climate change. By uh, the paper will be presented by uh, Marcus Brunemeyer from Princeton University, with two panelists uh, discussing the paper. So before starting, I'd like to, to thank Tommaso Monacelli, uh, who was managing editor for five years and who's uh, uh, today is uh, the last uh, uh, economic policy panel. Uh, so thank you very much, Tommaso, for the nice work you've produced during these years. And also we'd like to welcome uh, Isabel Mejean, who is starting her five-year term. Uh, so welcome, Isabel. And, uh, we hope we'll have a nice contribution from your, for, from your part. Um, so uh, just also before starting, some uh, information about the organization. Uh, we have 55 uh, minutes for each uh, presentation. So as usual, authors have 20 minutes, discussant, uh, each discussant has 10 minutes. And then we keep time for panel discussion, uh, about 15 minutes. So if you want to ask questions during presentations, so in principle, it's only clarifying question, and please ask your questions in the uh, in in the chat. Uh, but we try to keep questions for uh, the general discussion at the end. And also, when you want to ask a question, please uh, write the question in the or a piece of the question in the chat, so it will be easier to manage for all of us. So I think we are a little time ahead, but. Uh, we could perhaps uh, start now. So the first paper is by Vincent Sterk. It's about a startup and employment following the, the pandemic. So Vincent, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Pierre. Let me share my screen. Um, I hope you can see it. Very well. Okay, thank you. All right, well, thanks a lot to the organizers for uh, putting this uh, paper on the, on the program. Um, so before I start my uh, presentation, let me talk briefly about uh, our co-author, Christiana Benedetti van Sil. So she sadly passed away um, in May uh, this year after a long battle with uh, cancer. Uh, so she obtained her PhD from the EUI in 2011 and subsequently was briefly my colleague at UCL and then moved on to the European uh, Commission. Uh, she has been a tremendous uh, force in this uh, project. She has been full of energy and she has uh, especially made big contributions to the application of, the, of, of this project to Europe and also in translating it into policy reports for the European Commission. Uh, this was just one of her many, many projects. Uh, she had an immense amount of energy. Uh, for instance, she also set up an NGO, uh, Social Venture Africa, uh, to help uh, entrepreneurship in Africa. Um, we'll always remember her selflessness, uh, infectious energy, Italian charm, and uh, positivity and drive for change. We've lost uh, not only a uh, great economist, but also a very dear friend, and we are missing her very dear. All right, so let me move on to the paper. So the motivation of this paper is to think about startups uh, in, the, in the pandemic and what this might mean for uh, the years to come. Um, so needless to say, the COVID-19 pandemic has had enormous shocks to, to, many, being, to many firms. Um, now, if you think about the most vulnerable firms, um, then arguably those are startups. Um, they haven't yet... Uh, uh, accumulated much of a kind of a customer base, maybe uh, they don't have such great supply chain connections yet. They may have a relatively difficult access to credit and so on. So there are many reasons to believe that kind of startups are vulnerable to shocks. And indeed, if you look at it in the data, we do see that uh, startups uh, only survive at a fairly uh, low rate in the first couple of years. At the same time, startups are often considered the engine of growth. Um, just accounting-wise, they account for a lot of the jobs that are being created uh, in the economy and also for productivity growth. 
Okay, so now if the economy goes through this huge disruption uh, like the pandemic and to the extent that this also affects startups, then these effects may be felt through for, for many years because these kind of, if you have kind of a couple of cohorts with either few startups or kind of weak startups, these kind of cohort effects may, may ripple through uh, the economy. And this may be one of the uh, uh, margins through which uh, a pandemic like uh, the current one uh, may have long lasting uh, effects because we're kind of basically going to be kind of stuck with those cohorts for, for quite a while. And it might take a long time for the economy to kind of restore. All right, so now to think about uh, these kind of longer lasting effects, we developed this startup uh, calculator. In a way, it's quite simple. Uh, it's, it's essentially uh, an accounting tool to quantify the macroeconomic impacts of shocks to uh, startup uh, cohorts in the years to come. So to briefly outline uh, what it is, we consider three um, input margins. And in this calculator, you can kind of vary each of these. I'll show you uh, very soon. So the three margins are the following. So the first margin is uh, the number of startups. So potentially during a, a crisis like the current one, um, the number of startups falls. And typically we do see that uh, the entry rate is quite procyclical. For instance, during the Great Recession, uh, the entry rate fell, fell quite a bit. Um, so then with fewer uh, startups in the years to come, there may be uh, employment losses just kind of mechanically coming from that margin. The second margin we consider is the exit rate of young firms. During uh, a downturn, we also often see exit rates increase in particular uh, among uh, young firms. And here, when I say young firms, I mean firms up to uh, 10 years of, uh, of age. And then the final margin we consider in the, in the calculator is what we call the growth potential uh, margin, uh, which is essentially the startup size of, uh, of, 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 of these firms. So in previous research, we looked at cohorts of startups uh, born at different stages of the business cycle. And what you see is that um, uh, the effects of average size in the first year in these cohorts is extremely persistent. So cohorts that kind of start with, uh, with uh, small firms on average tend to remain cohorts of, of, uh, of small firms. So those, that margin is extremely persistent as well. So we kind of vary that margin as well with this kind of then going forward scale uh, the average size of the cohort by this growth potential uh, margin. Okay, so these are the three inputs that we can vary. And then the output of this is a response for uh, aggregate uh, employment. Okay, so then we apply this uh, calculator to the United States as well as uh, a number of uh, EU countries. Um, so how do we calibrate this? Uh, of course, we need, we need some data to kind of do these simulations. Um, for the United States, we use um, uh, the business dynamics statistics, which is a, uh, uh, an administrative data, data set, which essentially covers the population of firms. And then for uh, the European counterpart, we use Eurostat data, which also cover the populations of firms. Now, because these, these are publicly available data sets, they kind of report uh, um, uh, statistics for age, for firms by age bin, but for older firms, they kind of group them together. So we have to do some intra and extra collations. I, I won't go into the detail now, given that I would have uh, the 20 minutes. We have to do a little bit of that in order to proceed. Okay, so now as I mentioned, the principal system accounting tool in a very similar way as that people do accounting exercises for um, flows in the labor market, think of, sort of flows in and out of unemployment. This is very similar, but here we're thinking about entry and exits uh, of firms and as well as the size uh, of firms. One thing is that these flows in the labor market tend to be much higher uh, frequency flows, whereas in uh, firm dynamics, uh, this is this is slower, so that means that these effects uh, may be more uh, persistent. Okay, so now in principles is accounting. However, we do have an exercise with uh, in which we do an equilibrium feedback uh, adjustments. Uh, 
So you could imagine that, say, if there's a suck and then there's fewer startups and smaller startups, so aggregate employment falls, then maybe there's some equilibrium feedback effect that with lower aggregate employment, maybe we get downward pressure on, on wages, and this will then uh, induce firms to, to hire more. Now, in order to kind of do that kind of adjustment, we did something quite simple. We simply took uh, a labor supply and a labor demand elasticity uh, from the literature and then kind of solve for an equilibrium uh, dampening uh, factor. Okay, so then we consider a number of scenarios. Now we think the beauty of the calculator is that you can put in any scenario that you like, and we'll see in a moment that we have these applications. So you can, you know, whatever you, your preferred scenario is, you can just uh, put it in and compute what, what the outcomes are. In the paper, we consider a couple of scenarios. One is, um, Based one based on the latest data on startup activities. I'll talk more about this. Uh, it's sort of difficult to get sort of good uh, real time data on this, uh, and there may be some issues there. Another possibility is to kind of think about the worst case, which from a kind of robustness policy perspective may also be relevant. So in this case, we just set all three margins to whatever was the the worst possible outcome over the the sample period for which we have data. But then again, you can essentially put in any scenario that you uh, like. And then hopefully, um, even though it's only an accounting exercise, we hope that this uh, will help on this, uh, guide policy making to some extent, at least by uh, providing more insights on which of these margins matter and how much can these things matter for, for aggregate uh, employment. Okay, so here are the... Um, to web applica applications for the um, US and for uh, Europe. I am just posting them in the chat if you want to click through so you can um, you can see them yourself and play around a bit. So let me start with the US one, just show you very quickly how this works. So this is the, the US one, which is actually a bit more uh, low tech than the one for, for Europe. So here you see kind of the three margins that you can adjust. So here we assume that the uh, number of startups falls by 20%. Uh, so I can make that 25% if I want. 20% uh, that's sort of the largest decline that we saw over the over the sample. So that's why we said it that way. Then there's the growth potential margin. We assume fall of 10% here, but you can adjust it as you like. And then again, also the same thing for the survival rate. You can also adjust the duration of the shock. So baseline is one year, but you can make it three years or two years or different years for different margins. Um, and then what it does, it kind of calculates a time path for aggregate uh, employment. Another thing we allow for is a bounce back scenario. So maybe in the years to come, we'll see some, uh, some kind of a bounce back. So I can put in a 20% bounce back for the number of startups, then you see that uh, sort of in the after the decline, we get an increase and you can feed all these things in. Um, then we have, um, sorry, going back to my uh, slides, we have a similar one for Europe as well. That's on the side of the European Commission. Um, that one is actually a bit more detailed. Uh, so you can select a whole number of countries. Um, and we also have some results by sector even. Uh, but otherwise it, it works in exactly the same thing. One thing you can do in the European one as well is to uh, adjust the uh, labor demand in the labor supply and this is, uh, We personally don't have a very strong view on it, but if you do then you can, can adjust these, these numbers and see what that means. And then if you look at the time path, you, we plot here both the baseline scenario and the equilibrium. Uh, adjusted uh, version in which you typically get some uh, dampening. Okay, so um, let me go back to my slides and talk you through a couple of scenarios that we consider in the in the paper. Um, so the first one is this historical worst case. So we said both the number of startups and the growth potential and the survival rate to so whatever was the lowest level of for the sample. Um, and we assume that only lasts one year. So we started developing this in March last year, and then we had sort of that <laughs> optimistic view that maybe this, this will only be one year. Uh, so that's that's our baseline, baseline scenario. But of course, in the calculator, you can make it last longer as well. 
So then here we look at uh, the, the results. So that's the top panel. So we see that uh, we get a, a loss of about one and a half million jobs. So here we express it in number of jobs. You could also express it in percentage terms. Um, with and without the equilibrium uh, adjustment. Now, I think the key takeaway from this plot is really that um, uh, even though the shock itself lasts only for one period, the effects are extremely persistent. And this is just because the economy gets stuck with this cohort of small uh, and few firms for, for, for a long time. So it takes a long time for that to, uh, to restore. Okay, so uh, we also consider uh, an alternative scenario based more on more recent data. So this is from the business dynamic, uh, business employment dynamic. Um, so unlike the BDS, we do actually have data from the business employment dynamics over the pandemic period. So from the BDS, it stops in 2019. So it's useless in terms of constructing these scenarios. But for the BDM, we actually have some of some recent data up to 2020 Q3. So then we, when we compare 2020 Q3 to 20, uh, Q2 and 3 to the same quarters in 2019, we see that uh, the birth rates, so the startup rate fell a little bit. The exit rate increased by quite a bit among young firms. And then also the startup size was quite a bit uh, smaller. So this is another scenario that we consider uh, as opposed to this historical worst case. So now when we put this in, again, we get um, uh, quite a large and persistent decline in employment, although it's somewhat smaller than this historical um, uh, worst case uh, scenario. And importantly, notice that here the number of startups doesn't actually decline by that much, uh, according to the BDM. So then this is mostly driven by these two other margins, exits of young firms and uh, the low growth potential margin. Okay, so now another perhaps more controversial uh, way to construct these scenarios is look at business applications. Um, so these are kind of registrations for employer numbers in the US. So there's some work in the literature that kind of uh, studies the sort of the duration between application and the moment you actually start employing uh, workers that tends to be a distribution it can be very quick in a month, but it can also take say two years or something like that. So typically it's a couple of quarters uh, lag between application and uh, an actual startup. But the fascinating thing is that when you look at applications in the, um, in the, in the pandemic, we see this massive uh, spike uh, in applications. Um, we don't quite know where this is coming from, to be honest. I think it's still a bit of a, a mystery. If you look at the data, what's interesting is that uh, kind of the, this spike coincides almost precisely with the Paycheck Protection Program in the United States. But interestingly, startups weren't actually eligible for that program. So it's, it's, it's quite a mystery why, where this increase comes from. Also, there's a question whether this was, you know, is actually going to lead to an increase in startups because we saw from the, the actual data on startups, the BDM, that there wasn't an actual increase in the number of startups, at least not up to 2020 Q3. And so it could be that because there's this lag between applications and an actual startup, we will still see an increase in startups at some point, but then this will likely uh, have happened uh, uh, this year, 2020, uh, 2021. Now to look at that, we constructed another scenario in which kind of we have this big bounce back in the number of startups. Uh, that we took quantitatively as in these applications. So we say, suppose that that's, that's, that's a reality and this happens in 2021. Uh, we have some doubts whether that's actually the case, but now let's see what happens. Then you see that, of course, in 2020, you still get this big uh, effect, uh, but in 2021, uh, there's, there's much more of a recovery. Although, interestingly, uh, it still takes quite a few years to actually uh, revert back to, uh, to zero. Okay, so now let me talk a little bit about uh, Europe as well. So this is a, a, a table with just some statistics from uh, BDS and Eurostat on the startup rates, the survival rates, employment shares of young firms, et cetera. And then one interesting um, observation is that these days, so these are recent data, um, actually the EU on average is more dynamic 
in terms of business dynamics than uh, the US. It has a higher startup rate and also higher uh, exit rates. Um, so this kind of goes maybe through some of the conventional wisdoms of the US economy being more dynamic, but they have seen a very sharp decline in the, in the startup rate, which we haven't seen as much in, 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 in Europe. That said, within Europe, there's a lot of heterogeneity. Uh, you see, for instance, that Germany uh, has a much lower startup rate. And also, if you look at the shares of, um, uh, of employment accounted for by startups, so firms in year one or young firms, firms up to age 10, that tends to be relatively low in, in Germany. So there's some interesting heterogeneity there. So now to kind of think about a little bit of us for how this heterogeneity in dynamism affects the ripple through effects of these shocks, we did a couple of exercises. So first we constructed these worst case scenarios for a number of uh, European uh, countries shown in this panel um, over here. Um, so then we see that in general, the effects in Europe tend to be a little bit uh, smaller uh, than in the US with the exception of uh, Italy uh, over here. Now, of course, this can be either because uh, this historical worst case was just less bad in, in those countries than in the US, or it could have to do with the dynamism. So in order to look at that in the right panel, we redo the same exercise, but we now feed the same shock through to all, uh, all different countries. And then we see that most countries are become, becoming much more similar uh, to, to, the, to the US. An important exception though here is Germany, um, because Germany has uh, lower dynamism according to these data. So it means they rely less on startups for uh, job creation. So this, this, the effects of a bad cohort there are, are simply uh, um, uh, smaller because the startups are less uh, important in terms of accounting for uh, employment uh, creation. And if you were to look at this by industry, you see quite a, a similar pattern. You see that, for instance, in uh, services, um, uh, where, which is uh, less dynamic than, uh, than manufacturing, you see that these effects are, uh, are small. Um, okay, so let me conclude. Um, talk a little bit about lessons from policy as well. So we developed this accounting tool to understand the macroeconomic implications of shocks to startup activity, where we can uh, really can uh, adjust these three margins. Key takeaway, uh, the effects of very short-lived shocks like a pandemic can be very large as well as very persistent. It can take a very long time for this to, uh, to heal. Um, and uh, especially um, uh, this is the case in relatively dynamic economies or, or industries. Now, in terms of policy application, of course, it's not a structural model, so we have to be kind of careful. But um, if you look at many of the policy responses, for instance, the response in the United States, which is payment protection, uh, paycheck protection program, a lot of that has been kind of focused on rescuing existing firms. Right? For instance, uh, this PPP program, only, uh, only uh, existing firms, so not startups were, were eligible for, for that. Whereas here, if you kind of think about maybe the longer run damage of a pandemic like this, um, maybe we shouldn't just be focusing on kind of this rescuing of, 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 of firms, but also think about uh, measures to kind of keep up the number of entrants as well as the quality of these, uh, these entrants. Thanks. Thank you very much Vincent, for this very timely presentation. So now we have discussion by Bartos. Please Bartos, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you for um, asking me to discuss this paper, which I think is very good. And um, what I want to do, first of all, is kind of go over the paper and tell you perhaps a little bit more than Vincent had time for about um, what the authors do and what some of the um, uh, data issues are. Okay, um, so, um, this, this paper asks um, kind of a very well-defined question. Uh, policymakers have been concerned that the COVID-19 uh, pandemic may have negative persistent effects on aggregate employment. Uh, policy measures to protect existing jobs have been introduced, but 
Uh, young firms, firms that are at most five years old, actually account for a sizable fraction of employment, uh, about 10% of jobs in the United States and 12% in the European Union. And so the question this paper asks is, could the pandemic affect the aggregate employment via affecting firm startup activity and how much and how persistent these effects might be? And uh, in particular, uh, how will aggregate employment evolve under different scenarios regarding these three margins that Vincent talked about? So the number of startups, uh, their growth potential uh, and the survival rate. Uh, now, how do they answer the question? The main data source, uh, at least for the United States, is uh, the business dynamics statistics of the U.S. Census Bureau. This is uh, a very comprehensive data set uh, about uh, firms in the U.S. economy. Uh, however, it's annual data that actually ends in 2016, so the authors needed to extrapolate it through 2019. Um, and uh, but it is very comprehensive in terms of the cross-sectional dimension, uh, and so the authors are able to compute the number of firms, their average employment, and their survival rate by age. So really by differentiating uh, for how many years a given firm has existed. And so um, you can then formulate a scenario for the number of startups, their average employment, and the survival rate of young firms and really use this data set to compute the law of motion for these firms over time. Uh, and, that's, uh, and that's their calculator. That's, the, that's a conditional projection of aggregate employment given this scenario that they assume. Um, uh, and, um, and then you can also adjust this projection to account for labor market equilibrium effects. Okay, so there's gonna be fewer startups, uh, wages re will respond in equilibrium to some extent, and maybe some other um, some other jobs will be created. So I want to emphasize, I think this is a very useful thing, this, this calculator, and actually I haven't seen, it was, I found it helpful that Vincent showed you these, um, these websites where people can, um, can actually de design their own scenarios and uh, see how aggregate employment will evolve. Now, let me talk a little bit about what they find. So they have this baseline scenario in which they make the following qualitative assumptions. Um, and, and remember, this is annual data. So in year 2020, there's gonna be a one-time decrease in the number of startups and in the survival rate of young firms in the economy. And furthermore, uh, firms born in 2020 kind of, have a, kind of have a permanently lower growth potential. This particular cohort has a lower um, uh, growth potential. Uh, quantitatively, they are going to design the scenarios for West to match the worst outcome for each of these three margins that they see in their data. And that essentially corresponds to the Great Recession. They cannot use actual data from 2020 because their sample ends before that. And what's the main finding? Um, given this scenario, the, 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 uh, the predicted aggregate employment loss in 2020 is about 1% of, um, is about 1%, which is 1.2 million jobs. And this is, uh, that's the number that's adjusted for these uh, general equilibrium effects. And furthermore, importantly, this aggregate employment loss is very persistent. The cumulative job loss of uh, 8.5 million by 2030. Now, um, there is another data set that's not, le that's not as comprehensive uh, as I understand, but it is more timely. And so they have another scenario, which I think is very important because it actually uses data from 2020. So in this other scenario, they use data from the business employment dynamics, that's the alternative data source. Uh, it's quarterly, available up to 2020 Q3 at the time of writing. Now, this data shows only a small decline in the number of startups in 2020, but it actually shows decreases in average employment and the survival rate 
margins of young firms. So these two other margins that are as sizable as what the authors assume at baseline. And then if we compare this scenario with the baseline, the predicted aggregate job loss is only somewhat smaller. It's 1 million it's a, and it's about as persistent. So I think it's important that now we have actual data from 2020 and um, the findings come out similar. As a reference, in 2016, net job creation in the US economy by old firms, firms that are at least 11 years of age, was 0.6 million. Okay, so this is how many net jobs old firms are able to create in a typical year uh, in the US economy. If you're thinking that old jobs maybe, old firms are maybe uh, able to make up for what's happening with startups and young firms. Okay, then they look at these bounce back scenarios. Uh, they have two of them, each with above average startup activity in 2021. Uh, actually the best that they see in their um, um, business dynamic statistics sample or even better. So it's not just you know that we're going back to average, we're going above average in 2021. I think some bounce back in a number of startups seems plausible. I think above average growth potential or survival rate already in 2021 seemed very optimistic. And this is not a criticism of the authors. I'm sure they agree with me. They just want to show kind of, you know, a, a very optimistic scenario. Um, now, then they, um, there isn't actually an, yet another data source uh, that Vincent mentioned that business formation statistics, which is very timely, high frequency data, but some applications for employer ID. So it's not on actual startups. This data shows a very large increase in applications in 2020 Q3. In the literature, this data has been used to predict actual startups, but I agree with the authors that there are strong reasons to think that the relationship between uh, this, uh, these applications and actual startups the historical relationship that proved useful for forecasts may have broken down uh, during 2020, um, or at least may have been you know, severely affected by the pandemic. Uh, what I think what may, may have been going on um, lately is the economy may be experiencing some increase in the number of actual job creating startups, uh, but it's also been experiencing a rise in the exit rate and a fall in average employment by startups. Um, so some, in the literature, some people have shown that um, that the uh, that these most this most recent surge in applications for employment ID tends to be focused on firms that may not end up. Uh, actually hiring any workers. They're just one person creating a, uh, a business without actually creating uh, jobs for others. Okay, then they um, look at um, uh, Europe. I think it's very important that they do this. Um, and um, Vincent uh, explained how they do this and explained the results. So let me just uh, move on to my concluding comments. I think this is a, a useful, carefully written paper. It's an example of how economists can provide real-time input for policymakers, and I think the, um, the authors deserve praise for writing the paper. Now, of course, ideally, we would like to forecast conditional on detailed data on startup activity until a very recent past, and there are um, some data issues here. I think, however, the authors are doing a good job using the actually available data. Um, so what about the future? Obviously, one would like to see more data or more recent data to kind of know what's been, what's going on right now or what's been going on recently. I think it uh, going forward, it would also be interesting to see a model of how the pandemic has affected entry decisions and employment by startups. And I think Petra and Vincent can, we can certainly count on them to deliver such a model in the future. Finally, I was wondering, Many authors note that the startup activity has received little attention in the policy discussions during the pandemic. Um, what specific policy measures um, would the authors recommend or would they have recommended uh, to address this issue? I know they want to be modest, but uh, I wanted to probe them a little bit. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Bartos. So Denis is going to continue this discussions. Denis, the floor is yours. Yeah. Okay, can you see my slides? Yes. Let me make them big. Okay, right. Thanks to the editors and organizers for allowing me to discuss this paper, which is great. I'm also uh, very happy to just have seen Bartos discussion because Bartos stuck quite closely to the paper. And I think that's great because I have taken the liberty to wander off further field a little bit. And I hope our discussions are therefore complementary. Now, I just have one slide, a quick overview. So I've seen now there's a calculator. It illustrates various employment scenarios. For example, the worst case scenario and the bounce back scenario. The key margins are entry, exit, and the growth of young businesses, or startups, and these up or out dynamics or gazelles, gazelles are fast growing young uh, businesses, are really important. And, but it is an accounting tool. Uh, Vincent mentioned there is a bit of a model in the background as well, but that's, that's not the main part of the paper. So the main intuition is that seemingly small changes to startups can create persistent and increasingly strong ripple effects on the macro economy, which I think is fascinating. Uh, phenomenon that that everybody should be aware of in policy. Uh, of course, if you adjust for general equilibrium effects, as Vincent pointed out, with with a model, then you dampen the aggregate loss in employment by a little bit, by some twenty percent, which is not surprising. And and all that builds on the author's very detailed and very successful work, in particular the AER papers, twenty seventeen and this year. So overall, the paper is well written, is quite polished, and it's really a pleasure to read. Now, I'm going to have uh, three comments. So the first is on the context of the COVID recession. Is it, is it a cookie cutter recession or is it actually a bit different? This is what I want to highlight. Now, the paper could be applied to any recession in principle, but I would argue that conceptually the COVID recession is a little bit different. As, as widely discussed in other places, this recession has been characterized by supply and demand shocks that can differ sharply across sectors. So social consumption was hit very hard versus other consumptions. Many employees work from home. They're also stuck. They can't move from one location to the other or move jobs. But on the upside, say credit conditions are perhaps not quite as disastrous as during the global financial crisis. And I was wondering, therefore, how we should see the COVID recession in particular, um, given the special characteristics. And I think it would be interesting to focus more, therefore, on the sexual reallocation effects. So, for example, given this forced experiment of working from home, has there been actually a big boost for some businesses, perhaps? businesses that work without physical offices and, and you know, at, at the expense of, of perhaps boring you, I, I have an anecdote here, which is a good friend of mine who is a fairly senior executive in a very famous um, online business has recently moved to pitch.com. Pitch.com apparently will be how we will do our PowerPoint slides in the future. It's an online collaborative. And they attracted a lot of funding and got completely started precisely because it's an office-less business. They will no longer have, and they don't have an office. And, and, and they say, I, they told me that that's precisely why they were turbocharged during this recession. So I, I understand this is just one example, but it would be more in interesting to have more analysis at the sexual level of that kind. Presumably that's also relevant for policymakers. And Vincent showed us the calculator and there's also companion papers on the EU website. They do have industry, manufacturing, and services, but it's still fairly crude. And I don't know to what extent you can actually do something about this given data limitations, but I think it would be useful. Related to the COVID recession, I, I don't know these data. And I went to the website of the Census Bureau and looked at one of the data that Vincent was showing as well, the business formation statistics. But what Vincent wasn't showing us is the history here. I zoomed all the way back into 2005, and you can see the latter part. This is what Vincent showed us, right? There's this decline, and then in, in quarter three of 2020, there's this big, big, big increase, over 
And that's clearly striking, but what's even more striking in some sense is that nothing else of that kind was happening in previous recessions. You think of the global financial crisis, major recession, what is going on? Nothing. And I, that really makes me think, again, maybe the COVID recession is quite special. I, I would encourage the authors to perhaps discuss this a little bit more in the paper. I, I, I don't think it's a good idea just to kind of, you know, not mention this uh, except in, in passing. So put differently, what's the context? How does COVID compare to other shocks and crises? Uh, GFC, Brexit, you probably can't do anything about China. And then as a kind of almost a cheap point to make is as usual, the persistence is measured against some kind of assumed projected pretrend. And I was wondering, especially since we went through similar arguments in the global financial crisis, this is sort of realistic as a form of assessment, but that's a very cheap critique in a sense that this is not specific to this paper. The second comment I have is on policy and welfare. So the, the paper is clearly geared towards the policy community hence the websites. And I think that's commendable. I think I really want to highlight that's a great feature. But I was thinking the scenarios are perhaps not so easy to interpret. Um, perhaps Vincent and, and his co-authors are actually too careful because they, they try to map, uh, to map out all these scenarios. But if you look at the worst case scenario against the bounce back scenario, they're like night and day. You, you do argue that bounce backs are perhaps not so common historically, but I was wondering whether you can kind of guide the reader a little bit more into what you think is the most likely scenario. And I understand we as sort of academics are not comfortable doing that, but I think for policymakers that, that would be useful. And then also, uh, so just as a picture, this is it, right? So this is the, the worst case scenario at the top and then the bounce back. I and mean, if you just look at 2021, that's, a, that's night and day, right? Over a million job losses, in, in 2021 versus uh, just you know, not that many, just one or 200,000 in the bounce back scenario. That's obviously a gigantic difference. And then should we subsidize startups? So then we get into these normative questions by how much, you obviously need a model for that. But I was wondering out of sheer curiosity whether policymakers have actually referred to your scenarios. Have you gotten any feedback from people from the commission or somewhere in the US? It's just a point of interest. I think it would be nice to know. Um, yeah, welfare, again, this is beyond, as I warned you at the beginning, I'm now straying beyond the kind of more narrow focus of the paper. Vincent mentioned that perhaps this policy of furloughs, rescuing or propping up existing firms was misguided. Perhaps that should be a much more targeted policy on uh, startups, but then from an administrative point of view, how do you do this, right? I just know actually quite some detail, the treasury in the UK, they, they went with previous tax returns, right? So, I mean, if you're a startup, you don't have a previous tax return. So how can you base your furlough on, on no information? So from a practical point of view, I'm sure a policymaker would be interested in that. But from a welfare point of view, perhaps it's actually not the case at all that we should have subsidized or targeted those startups because maybe the, the virus was so bad that suppressing all the economy uh, that has social elements in it was actually optimal. I don't know. But it would be interesting to know more about this. And then um, also one question I had, to what extent do your results, especially the updated and more recent data, already reflect policy intervention, for example, the CAS Act? You mentioned that very briefly. But again, that's beyond the paper, probably, because you would really have a, a much fuller model with simulation. And then my final comment is even more bigger issues. I was wondering about self-employment and informal work. Going back to the business applications figure, the data that we just looked at, I, I presume that must have been a big factor this time around in the recession, but I'm not sure. Then as a trade economist, I'm perhaps naturally more interested in spatial aspects. So if you think about cities having an edge um, because of agglomeration economies, scale economies, but perhaps people leaving cities, large cities in this recession, is that going to matter? But in your model, you don't have that, right? I mean, you don't have external economies of scale or any such things, but that might be relevant. Um, supply chains is sort of a very topical issue, how, how maybe it doesn't matter for startups. Will the pandemic produce more graduates? We have a huge increase, at least in economics uh, students. Maybe that will play a big role further down the line. And I, I really like the interesting breakdown by country and Bartosz actually discussed this. Quite some, quite some detail. I think that's quite, quite useful for, for a policymaker.
All right, so let me, let me wrap up. I think it's a very important, uh, timely question, clearly relevant for policy, well-written, carefully executed, but there might be some scope to dig a little bit deeper into, into the data. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Tonis and Bartos for these comments. So I, I propose that we gather questions before you answer, Vincent, so that you'll be able to, to answer more synthetically to questions we have. So perhaps let me start since we don't have any questions on, uh, on the chat. Tell me in the chat if you want to, to, to ask a question. Um, so I, I was just wondering, how do you take into account the heterogeneity of, of startup? Because there are many different types of startup. For instance, in France, you can create micro firm, which are not devoted to, to grow. And during the pandemic, there have been a huge increase in, in this, uh, in this uh, type of startup. So yeah, this is a, an important question, I think, because there is a very strong heterogeneity of type of startup. And depending on the type of startup that are created, you, you can get very different results. So I wonder whether you account for that in your, in your exercises. Uh, there is, so yeah, who has a, sorry, I, I don't see, I see a question here. So what has that? Me? Yeah, Tomazzo. please, Tomaso, go. Okay, good. Uh, so thank you, Vincent, and thanks for the discussions. I think this is a very interesting uh, topic, actually, and uh, in, uh, in, in, in a way also phenomenon. Uh, so two things. One is, uh, based on your uh, uh, sort of machinery, uh, uh, is there something that can be said about productivity? So, and, uh, and the effects over time on productivity. And the second point I think is about really reiterating uh, uh, what Dennis was saying, because the, the, the data he showed uh, uh, were, uh, were uh, uh, impressive in, in that um, the, the COVID recession uh, uh, sort of uh, seems uh, uh, indeed uh, very different, like a supply shock that artificially restricts uh, the possibility of, uh, of running new startups and then there's this bounce back truly. So what is really, uh, 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 again, intuitively, what is built in in your mechanism whereby if you, you know, exogenously, artificially uh, 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 sort of restrict, uh, constrain the possibility in, 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 vari in various forms, right? On the supply side, if you, if you make uh, uh, for temporarily very, very high uh, uh, the cost of, uh, of starting a new business, um, uh, what makes this effect then in the, in the, in the bounce back so, uh, so persistent? Okay, thank you. Apparently, there is no, no more question at that point. So, Vincent, you want to start answering, and I guess new question will emerge. Please. Um, yes, thank you very much. Uh, also, Peter, I mean, feel free to, uh, to speak up. I mean, Peter is in Australia, so he is, uh, kids might be asleep and he may have to be a bit quiet. But so, so, uh, let me just start answering those questions. Um, first of all, thanks to, to the two discussants. Um, Dennis uh, Bartos, uh, those were great comments. Also, thanks for the other comments. Let me just try to take them in uh, reverse order. Uh, so starting with Tommaso, productivity. Yes, in principle, we could do similar exercise for productivity. It's just that in these publicly accessible uh, admin data sets, we only see employment. But we know that in particular for Europe, those productivity data are also available. So it's, it's just um, they're kind of in confidential data sets. But in principle, this you could do exactly the same exercise for productivity. Um, what we know from current accounting exercises, for instance, in work by John Halterwanger, is that uh, startups account for quite a bit of productivity growth. So this suggests that these, these effects of kind of um, uh, small and bad cohorts of startups might also have uh, substantial impacts on uh, productivity. Uh, uh, as well. Then, so with the, um, the the other question, sort of, why is it that with the bounce back uh, you still get some persistent effect? It's it's because it's sort of a cohort effect. Is that you first have a, a, a cohort of um, a few uh, a few startups, and then a cohort with many startups. But because there's a life cycle profile, sort of startups grow but, uh, in the first couple of years. So the positive effect of the younger cohort that kind of compensate is always going to be a bit smaller than the negative effect of the cohort that came before that because they're, they're on average a bit larger. 
But, but so just to clarify, so I, I was just to, uh, so because that looks a bit artificial, right? Uh, because it's obvious, it's, if you take, so if you accept the notion that, you know, the, the drop in business formation was uh, was exogenous and was uh, again was per se artificial was was due to the so suppose we suppose we were artificially closed down the whole uh, the whole economy as we did <laughs> in uh, uh, with the covid recession then then artificially you can actually increase persistently the number of uh, startups in the future and that sounds uh, I don't know. Economically, it sort of skips a bit my my uh, intuition. It is as if it would be better to shut down the economy for a while uh, in order to get a more, uh, you know, a persistent uh, effect of business creation in the future. Oh, I see. Yeah. So uh, we don't mean to suggest that like a low startup cohort this year kind of would lead sort of causally to a big uh, cohort the next year. Uh, and in fact, in in, in um, maybe this is something that could you could generate in a model, but historically that's not something that has really happened uh, very often. Um, so it was really just that because there is these data on, on applications that suggest that maybe next year or maybe 2021 is going to be this year with a lot of startups, we just kind of wanted to explore that possibility, but we, we really don't take any stance on the sort of the causal uh, mechanisms uh, behind it. Um, it's really just uh, sort of an accounting exercise. Then in, um, on um, uh, Pierre's question, sort of, uh, do we account for differences in the type of startup? Yeah, I think that's, that's a great question. And that, that relates also to back to our earlier work, which we kind of uh, documented or estimated that a lot of the heterogeneity in firm size is due to uh, ex ante heterogeneity. So you kind of think of startups as being of different types. Some of them are low potential, others are high potential from the start. And this is all kind of reflected in this growth potential margin essentially uh, that we have. So when we think about sort of a decline in growth potential, the way we think about this uh, underlying is that basically you have fewer uh, kind of high growth startups and more low growth uh, startups. Okay, so then let me go uh, to uh, uh, Denise's questions on sectoral allocation. Um, I think that's a fascinating topic in which, on which we hopefully will learn uh, a lot in the coming years. Yeah, it's, it's likely that there is some uh, sectoral relocation. Maybe some of this was due to happen anyway, but got sort of accelerated by the, by the pandemic. If you look at these applications uh, and this huge spike in, in business applications, what's interesting if you go down to a more granular sectoral level, you see a lot of that is happening in um, the sectors like online retail, which does suggest that there is some of that relocation going on. At the same time, it might also be that these are really sort of existing businesses that sort of now open uh, like a new business that sort of does the, the online branch of what they're doing, but it's sort of in a way not really a new business. So I think part of this 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 spike in, in applications could be a little bit of that as for firms just kind of sort of set up a new sort of uh, administrative or, or legal uh, entity doing something slightly different. Um, but there's a question of sort of how sort of economically uh, meaningful that shift is. But I think in the coming years, uh, when the data will come out, I think we'll, we'll, we'll learn a lot about it. At this point, I think we're still sort of a little bit too restricted in terms of the, the data that we have available to say a lot uh, about it, at least the data sets that, that we've been uh, uh, looking at. Coming to the related points that, uh, yeah, so it would be great to do this at a sort of very granular sector level um, uh, and think about this reallocation uh, between sectors. I think to do that properly, you would really have to go down to a very granular level to make a kind of a distinction, for instance, between physical retail and online retail and so on. Unfortunately, in these data sets that we use, these administrative data sets, um, we, we can't really go down to, to, to that detailed level. Although in principle, those in uh, kind of the, uh, with access to the underlying uh, micro data would be able to probably uh, do that. So in principle, it's possible. I think it's sort of more practical consideration that you know, prevents us from, from, from um, doing that. Um, on the pre-trend, yes, sure, we, we have to assume something about the trend. I don't think for, because we 
express everything in deviations from the trend, what, uh, what pre-trend you assume, and then quantitatively it has very limited uh, implications on the actual exercises, um, I would uh, uh, expect. Then um, the question, what is the most likely scenario? Um, yeah, um, that's a million dollar question. Um, and I'm, I'm actually, each time a, a new um, uh, um, version of the uh, business dynamic statistics is coming out, I'm looking forward to it. So, um, because each, each time you, you, you kind of get another quarter and we'll learn a bit more. What I learned from the last uh, version was that, that basically this, this increase in startups, at least in 2020 Q3, hadn't really realized that at this point, I'm pretty skeptical about seeing this massive increase in startup uh, activity. But of course, we, 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 uh, we don't really know. Probably there's going to be some, uh, some, some bounce back next uh, in, in this year. But uh, yeah, again, I, I wouldn't really um, uh, take this, uh, this huge bounce back all too, too seriously. That was sort of more to kind of explore that, that possibility. I, I, I would have my doubts that that's actually gonna, gonna happen. Um, so welfare and policy, yes, uh, yeah, of course, there's accounting models who can't really do much in terms of sort of actual sort of optimal policy exercises and such. Um, but of course, we can think about policy and we should think about it. And I think the point you raise about sort of how you practically do these things is, is really important. So for instance, if you think about the payment, a paycheck uh, protection program in the US, where basically all firms that were born after February uh, 2020, so all startups from the pandemic were basically excluded. Um, that was probably done for sort of practical reasons in the sense that it's very difficult to prevent fraud uh, if you think about startups, because everybody can start a new, say you start, you, you introduce some kind of lump sum uh, subsidy for startups, then you know, everybody can start a firm and say, hey, uh, give, give me the, uh, give me the subsidy. So I think there are, there are very uh, important practical considerations in terms of sort of stimulating uh, startup uh, activity. So you'd have to think about some mechanism that does that in a way that sort of uh, prevents um, misuse of the, of, of, of the system. Vincent, um, Vincent, yeah. Sorry, we have other questions. So please, if you want to keep time for the other questions. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm running out of time. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me just, um, uh, um, I'm saying the, the other comments were, were, were great as well, uh, Dennis. Um, we can talk about them more uh, later. Um, but well, thanks a lot for the, for, for the, for the discussion. Uh, I see uh, a couple of questions in the, in the chat, sorry. Maurice, I, I Maurice has a question, he was the first I'll, I'll skip mine. Vincent has um, basically answered the policy side, so happy to pass on. Okay, Ryan? Right. Okay, thanks. Uh, very interesting presentation. Um, my question is about exits and the relation between exits and entry, because what we've seen in COVID so far is that with all this government support, exits have been incredibly low, it seems, or at least insolvencies and bankruptcies are low, so I presume exits have also been uh, low. Now, what would one, one addition to your framework would be nice to have a relationship between an elasticity between exits and entry and what that presumes means for job growth and so I think from a policy perspective that'll be extremely interesting so it's more of a suggestion and, and maybe ways to think about how you would add that to what you've done. Uh, yeah that's a very interesting point uh, I would like to look again at the data this my, my impression was even though maybe insolvencies hadn't really increased that much I think there has actually been quite a bit of exit during the during the pandemic if I remember that but I should check again the data from the business uh, employment. Uh, uh, at least, if you look at the young firms, which I had in my uh, in my table, there was this increase uh, decrease in the survival rate of these firms. So it seems that there that there has been been some of that, but it could also be that there's still sort of this this exit that's that's about to come of firms that have been sort of supported through the, through the um, through the pandemic. But once that support falls away, that we might see like an, an additional increase in, in exit. Um, in, in the, I think I agree. It's very interesting to think about the relation between entry and exit, and I think to do that properly, you need a, a more sort of general equilibrium kind of framework. Um, sort of think of a Oppenheim kind of firm dynamics uh, model. 
So there is another question by Rob. Yes, I very much like the, uh, the, the presentation. Now, in the discussion, there was a comparison of the uh, COVID crisis with, um, well, previous crisis. And I was wondering whether, um, I mean, whether changes in the labor market, what, what role they have, they can play uh, in these differences. Since uh, it's my impression that now the labor markets are much more tight than uh, after previous crisis. Uh, well, it's certainly true for my own country, but it's probably true for other countries that um, you know startups may not be able to to get uh, employees they they want. Could you maybe say something on that? Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks. That, that's a very interesting question. I haven't thought that much about this particular point. I think it is true. Um, that uh, startups are having troubles uh, finding uh, workers in such a tight uh, uh, labor market. There is some work uh, on kind of um, models whereby uh, uh, Postofine uh, or by kind of these job ladder models, which kind of suggests that kind of the low productivity uh, firms are kind of the most uh, sort of exposed to changes in market time because they're sort of at the bottom of the ladder. So they're the ones who kind of hire from an employment and such. Uh, to the extent that those are startups, I think they, they might be more affected indeed by uh, labor market uh, tightness. At the same time, uh, some startups may actually be you know, quite high potential startups. They, they, uh, they, they might not necessarily be hiring from uh, an employment, if you think, for instance, about sort of tech startups or, or something like that. So, so those sort of more high potential startups may be a bit less uh, affected. But it's, an, it's a very interesting point. I'd like to think more about it. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. So thank you very much to all of you for the presentation discussion. I think it's time to go to the, to the next paper. Uh, which is going to be presented by uh, Marco Niedu. And uh, so the floor is yours. And also to Kevin, who is going to uh, share the next session. Thanks very much, um, Marco. It's, it's all yours. Yes. You have 20 minutes. You. Yeah. Can, you, can you see my screen? Yep. Yeah. OK, good. So um, this is, thank you. First of all, thank you a lot for, for, for having us. This is a joint paper with uh, Lorenzo Pandolfi, who is based at the University of Naples and is also here in, in the audience. So the focus of this paper, as you can probably guess from the title, is the productivity of public employees. And there are two broad set of reasons why we care about the productivity of public workers. The first one is that they, they represent a large share of total employment in, in many countries. It's about 20% in OECD countries. And the second set of reasons is that they are in, often in charge of providing essential goods and services such as, for instance, healthcare, education, research. So this implies that it's very important to understand how to motivate these workers, how to uh, foster the productivity, because in turn, in turn, this will translate into a higher uh, um, and better provision of these public uh, goods and services. But if we compare the problem of public managers to the problem of private managers, there is a, a, a big difference. And this big difference is that the set of tools available to motivate uh, public workers is much more limited in the, in the case of public managers. And this typically happens because the public organization have these uh, compensation schemes in public organization are typically rigid and uh, wages are set uh, at the centralized level, and they often don't allow to include this pay for performance component that has been found to be extremely effective in, in the private sector. So if these wages are almost uh, mechanically tied to seniority and career advancement, what is actually um, uh, left in the hands of, of public management as a motivation lever are career-based incentives. But one thing that is surprising is that we know very, very little about the effectiveness of these career-based incentives. There is a growing literature, but is still limited. And if you, if you think about the reason why probably we know uh, not so much about the effectiveness of these career-based incentives is that it's difficult to identify, uh, to find a setting um, that is 
somehow close to the ideal experiment where you randomly allocate these promotion incentives uh, or different dosage of promotion incentives to different uh, employees. So we believe we, we found such a, such a setting and we found such a setting for a large sample of high skill public employees that are uh, academics in, in Italian public, public universities. Um, so one, one important thing is that in Italy since 2012, in order to, to move up the, the academic ladder, um, there is a centralized evaluation procedure that is called the National Scientific Qualification. So National Scientific Qualification is a qualification that is needed in order to become associate and full professor. And this qualification is awarded mostly on the base of past research productivity that is measured by uh, typically three indicators that need, have to satisfy to be above some well-defined threshold. And this setting has two a uh, very nice feature to, to our that we exploit in our analysis. The first one is that here the promotion bar, that means the level, the standard you have to reach in order to become an associate and a full professor is very clear, is observable, is based on objective measures of past productivity. The second nice feature is that the outcome of this evaluation procedure basically uh, put different scholars on different career trajectories. And if we restrict the analysis, so if we look only at the marginal scholars, we can say that we find this quasi random variation in career prospects. So let me elaborate just a bit more on this point because it's the key idea of the paper. So imagine, think about the following example. Think about two mostly identical, almost identical candidates, assistant professor who apply for the associate professor qualification. The only difference between the two is that one just satisfied the requirements for the associate professor qualification, so he get, she gets the qualification. While the other one, because he's missing just an epsilon, an article, a citation, something about the uh, past research productivity, uh, doesn't get the associate professor qualification. So for the first, uh, scholar, there is now a new career goal that is unlocked. So the goal after getting the associate professor qualification in next, in next future, the goal is meeting the requirements for a full professorship. So, so try to apply and get the full professor qualification. And typically these requirements are higher in terms of research productivity. So there is a clear incentive to increase uh, the productivity so as to reach this promotion bar. While the other one, that one that for a tiny bit uh, doesn't get the qualification, the goal is still to reapply and get the associate professor pressure. And for this second candidate, this goal uh, entails very little promotion incentives because given that he was, she was already there, she was just below the threshold, uh, the increase in productivity that she has to do to get to over this threshold is very, is very low. So, um, if from the comparison of these two marginally uh, candidates, so from, so from the comparison of barely qualified and barely non-qualified assistant professor, we can estimate the effect of what is at the end an increase in the expected future promotion bars. So we, we kind of have this uh, quasi-random allocation of different career prospects and then this um, of different promotion incentives. So what do we find? we find that these barely qualified scholars tend to publish after getting the associate professor qualification, six more papers in the following four years. And these are, this is more or less compared to the average is, is an effect of about 40%. So it is a very large effect. Importantly, they, this increase in quantity does not come at the expenses of like the quality of this publication measured by the quality of the journal where they publish. Plus, we have also two important set of results that support our view that the, this, this increase in publication is, is actually driven by this promotion incentive story. The first is that, is that we do not find a similar effect if we look at the sample of scholars who work under different incentive schemes. Think about the same example as before, but for associate professors that are now uh, getting or not getting this full professor qualification. For them, there is not any difference in promotion incentives, given that the full professor, the full professorship is actually the, at the top of the economic ladder. So there is not another goal 
ahead that is triggered by passing or getting or not getting the qualification. And the same applies for um, scholars that are working in non university institution because likely for them, uh, the uh, outside options are different and the incentive schemes are, are different. The, import, the second important set of results is that we find the effect for assistant professor to be driven by the group of scholars who are not too close and not too far from the expected full professor threshold. That means those in the middle of the distance from um, the, 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 the next promotion uh, threshold. And this is consistent with several studies, theoretical studies on career incentives that says that basically that incentives are, uh, career incentives are very effective when the promotion is possible, but is not too easy to achieve, nor is too, is too difficult to, to achieve. Okay, so let me spend, I already said something about the institutional setting. I just say a few more words on this. So the National Scientific Qualification was introduced in 2010 and the first round was uh, in 2012. So what technically what the National Scientific Qualification does is to award the eligibility for career advancement. So the eligibility to become an associate professor or a full professor, but like the, the actual appointment still happened at the, um, at the decentralized level. That means that in order to become, but still in order to become an associate professor in any university in Italy, you need to obtain before this uh, qualification. And this qualification is awarded by a committee of five, at the time of five randomly selected full professors. And the key criteria on this committee uh, take into account is to measure past research productivity. So the criteria change depending on the academic field and academic fields are grouped into broad groups of, of academic fields. So we focus on what they are called like these bibliometric uh, sectors or fields that include fields such as medicine, biology, physics, mathematics, etc. No economics there. Um, so in this particular sector, there is a two out of three rule. So you have three indicators, the number of articles published in the past 10 years, the number of citations received in the H index, and a necessary condition to get the qualification is that uh, the candidate must uh, overcome, overcome the threshold for at least two of these three uh, indicators. Um, they, there are, of course, this is just an almost an, is a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient because then, and this in, introduces a degree of fuzziness in our design because also there are other aspects to, of the CV that are taken into account, but still is, uh, is uh, indicated as the most important criterion by, by the ministry. So um, just give a quick look to the data we, we, we use to, um, to, to for our analysis. The first set of data is that we have the list of all the applicants to the first round of the NSQ. And for each applicant, we have their score and the sector specific threshold. So, uh, and these allow us to um, uh, define the distance from each of, of these thresholds for each, for each candidate. Plus we combine this list of applicants with the professor census that allow us to identify who is an associate professor or a full professor in Italian academia. In our main sample, we focus on tenured assist assistant professor. And uh, in Italy now, there are also a category of untenured assistant professors, but these were introduced basically around the same time of the NSQ. So they are very few in, in, our, in our sample and we look in an extended sample analysis. For each of these applicants, we retrieve the entire publication record uh, from Scopus. And we do two kinds of uh, queries in this case. So we get all the publication of, that each candidate pub, uh, made in the post NSQ and even in the pre NSQ period. And this longitudinal dimension is gonna be very useful for uh, some of the exercise that we'll show you later. Plus for each of the items she published, we also, run a separate query to get cover type, uh, author's affiliation, publication date, journal information that uh, allow us to define our measures of quality. So um, as I said, what, what, given that we are comparing marginal candidates, our design is a regression discontinuity design, but this has two source of 
two, two source of complexity compared to a standard regression discontinuity design. The first one is that we don't have a single running variable, but we have three. And we have these two out of three rule that is defining whether you comply with the requirements on or not. And the second uh, set of complexity is that we actually have a lot of, var of variation between fields because every academic field has a separate committee and different cutoffs. So it's basically a three-dimensional regression discontinuity, discontinuity design with multiple cutoffs because every uh, field has specific threshold. We model all this in a full parametric form when if this B IS is the indicator for the compliance with the two out of three rule. This alpha one for the first stage equation gives you the weighted average of crossing what at the end is not a single dimension frontier, but is a three dimensional frontier that you can cross from many different sides. So given that you have a three dimensional space, the frontier is actually an hyperplane. And you can cross an hyperplane from different space. And what this alpha one coefficient gives you is the weighted average of the effect in the probability of getting the qualification or all of all these different crossings. And to account for the uh, uh, heterogeneity between fields, we of course have field fixed effect, but also we allow for the function of the distance of each of the indicators with uh, the corresponding threshold to be fully flexible across academic fields. Uh, of course, this design still relies on the standard uh, identification assumption for a regression discontinuity design, namely uh, there is a first stage given that our design is fuzzy, that we don't have evidence or manipulation or selection, uh, exclusion, restriction, monotonicity, plus given that our approach is uh, a parametric approach, we also want to be sure that what we are capturing is not a misspecification uh, is not due to a misspecification of the functional form. I won't have time to go through all of them. I will just spend some time on the first stage and this last point. So to give you a more intuitive example of what we are doing, here you, we, you see the plot of the discontinuity in the probability of getting the qualification. But here, all these separate uh, discontinuities here in each of these, you are not taking into account where the candidate is located depending on in the other indicators. So, and this is the reason why this jump seems to be uh, relatively small. So what we do in our triple RD is to combine all these smaller jumps into a pooler, in a pooled version of, uh, of this, uh, this regression discontinuity that is our triple RD. That is, um, it takes into account the fact that you can actually cross the discontinuity from many sides and takes into account when a candidate is located uh, on a three-dimensional space. And you can see that in this case, the first stage uh, coefficient is 0.31 percentage point. That is a, a large increase. So we do have a first stage and we can use this first stage to look at uh, the productivity consequence of being uh, given different promotion incentives. And if we look at the overall number of paper published in the 2013-16 period, that means in like the four years following the qualification for assistant professor, you see that there is an increase that is about more than six papers. We can unpack this, this result and look and you exploit our longitudinal dimension for doing two main exercises. The first one is that you want to make sure that this effect here is not actually the consequence of the fact that the, the marginal candidates you are comparing uh, were not different from uh, even in the pre-NSQ period. But we see that the effect of getting the qualification is specific of the post-NSQ period. And so this implies that the candidates are actually similar. Uh, and so you are not capturing ex-ante differences between them. The second exercise you want to do is that this effect here and even this one can also be the consequence of the marginally non-qualified scholars that get discouraged because they don't get the qualification. So they reduce the publication. Because we have this uh, longitudinal dimension, we can check which side of the threshold is moving, whether these are the ones who get the qualification who increase or conversely whether they are the other ones who decrease. And we see that is actually the, the first option that happens. 
As I said, we do not find any effect on the terms of quality of publication measured by uh, indicators of the quality of the journal when where the uh, scholars publish. And um, I don't know, if, I think I have still a few minutes. I, I want just to discuss the- yeah, you, some... you have, three, you have four, four minutes, something like that. Okay, great. So I, I just want to spend some time to discuss why we believe this effect is actually driven by pro promotion incentives. So the first is that, uh, as I said, the, um, the theoretical literature on career incentives says that these incentives are effective if uh, the, the goal you have to reach is a feasible goal that has to be not too far, not too difficult to reach nor too easy. And th this is actually what we, we observe. Our average effect seems to be mostly driven by those who are in the middle of the distance from the full professor threshold, exactly those for whom the uh, promotion bar is not too close nor too far. So this is consistent. Um, moreover, if you think about associate professor who apply for a full professor qualification, um, you, you see that there is no difference in terms of past of post and SQ productivity for them. And this makes sense because these guys, there is no difference in incentives between uh, these marginal candidates because this is already the top of the academic ladder. So there is not another goal they can target and a reason to increase productivity directly linked to promotion incentives. And the same happens if we look at the extended sample. So in principle, everyone um, can apply to the associate professor qualification. So not just our main sample is made of this tenured assistant professor. And um, there are also a, like very few untenured assistant professors here that I say there are few because this is a, a theory that was just recently introduced in Italy by that time. But you see that our effect is mostly driven by uh, these tenured assistant professors, while we do not find a strong effect for researchers that are, were working in 2012 in non university institutions, because for them, career incentives are weakened by the fact that they already have different incentives, different incentive schemes in the uh, institution they were working uh, in. So we, um, we, of course, I, I won't have time to go through all these additional results. We run battery of heterogeneity tests for in terms of area, gender, age. Um, also, we we are very careful with our, given that we have a, a parametric approach, we try uh, how robust are our results to alternative sample restriction, how we deal with multiple applications. And we also try to implement some um, uh, non-parametric uh, uh, exercises to see whether our results are robust and they, and they are. So um, what about the, the, the conclusion, the, the main intake of, of from this analysis? So the main message is that actually scholars in our sample strongly respond to uh, this quasi-random increase in the threshold they have uh, to reach. So this promotion bar. And this happens, especially if this bar is set in a way such that it's not too close nor too far. And this tell has two, uh, has two important implications. The first one is that Italy is not the only country that implemented like a similar, similar evaluation criteria. And so in general, this result may apply to uh, many other systems such as the, the ones that are implemented in France, Germany, Portugal, and Spain. And this proved that this system can actually enhance research productivity. But more, more broadly, these results also say something about all productivity in all public organization characterized by internal labor market. That is labor market where a career advancement happens mostly within the organization and there are no, and mostly is like a vertical, uh, um, is, is the career uh, happens vertically within the same organization. And also in organization when you can actually objectively measure individual output, but there is the, it's difficult to, um, there is the risk of moral hazard in the sense that um, employees can, can exert, decide how much effort to, to exert. And the last point is that in the debate whether between objective and subjective uh, way to evaluate uh, public candidates, we say that these, all these results hold 
when evaluation criteria are transparent and output based, and so they are clearly recognizable and, and observable. Okay, thank you very much indeed. So our first discussant is Roland Ratlow. Thank you. Let me share my screen. screen can you see it now yep okay great. Uh, so thanks a lot uh, thanks for the invitation it was a really a pleasure to to read this paper uh, congrats really to to marco and and and, and, and lorenzo for for this great work super well written also I, I really admire the care with which they they answered all the you know all the referees remarks and all the care they put in the in the in the process it's really impressive so now the paper looks extremely careful and there are a lot already, lots already of responses to you know potential naive comments that I could have made. So so I, I try to make some, but you have already a lot of answers in your paper. Uh, so as a short summary, I mean this this paper um, really short because you just had the, the better version right now. But so the question is really: Do promotion criteria provide incentives to to Italian academics? So you have this reform in 2012 where you have the system of habilitation that that becomes a requirement to, to be promoted uh, associate or full. Um, then there is this, this difference between fields. You have this bibliometric fields in which in particular the three uh, criteria are the, the, well, indicators are the number of articles, citations, and H index. And you have a criterion that is a bit complex, especially for us, which is you have to do better than the median uh, associate or full prof on two out of three indicators. So that makes for a criterion that is not only uh, a bit fuzzy because you have two out of three, which is not super easy to, to, to handle, but also the fact that you have this moving target because it totally depends on the, on the cohort you're, you're, you belong to in a way. Um, so the, the, so the, the estimation is made using a fuzzy uh, RDD with uh, three dimensions. Uh, and the main result is that indeed there is an increase in uh, in, in academic output with the with the, the move on uh, when when there is an upgrade in in the in the in the in the, in the target somehow that people have to achieve. Um, there is an additional result uh, about the heterogeneity of the treatment effect, and in particular, the question of how does the effect of incentives vary according to the distance to criteria, and and they show this. Well, this inverted U shape, we, we, we're going to talk a little bit more about that because, I mean, I have questions and, and concerns about this particular finding. Um, so maybe one comment is really about trying to interpret really what, what the authors measure. Um, I was wondering all the time whether we should interpret it as a lower bound or an upper bound. So, so first, why, why a lower bound? Well, in the perfect experiment, you would take your pool of academics you would randomize incentives to them, and then you would just see, you know, what happens. Obviously, we're not; it's not possible to do that. So here, you have you you're going to compare this group that just failed the abitazione by very little, but you know, I mean, they just failed it, and they can retake it, and they can retake it, and very very likely they are going to get it, uh, and so they they are not going to face maybe in one year or maybe in a couple of years they are going to face the full prof criteria. Um, so in this case, um, the difference, I mean, if you're thinking about it, I mean, if you're very rational, you should already be in full gear to try to, to, to aim for the, for the target that you know is going to be yours in, in just a couple of years. So, but maybe you have some very short-sighted short people and that may be those who actually create the, create the, the phenomenon. So here you have short-sighted people who basically stay with the criteria of the associate profs, and maybe you have some of them that are still associate prof because they failed, but they are going to kind of think already about the full prof criteria. So in a sense, um, I mean, I wonder whether this not, doesn't create a lower bound, because if you think that this is the case, that is some people already internalize the next set of incentives, then you have a lower bound. Now, you could also have an upper bound. Why? Because in a sense here, you have two treatments at four, 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 one. Um, so you, and that, was, that is perfectly well discussed in the paper. Uh, so you have a, a set of immediate incentives, which is the main treatment that we consider. And then you have a kind of a behavioral treatment, which is your awarded promotion versus your denied promotion. Uh, and so it, it's, um, there, are, there are a lot of things that are discussed like that in the paper. 
One is that if you if you saw the the what what Marco showed about the you know whether action happens for those who are awarded uh, versus those who fail, you see that clearly the action. I mean, there is a there is the, the figure is actually I think very telling, and the action is really going by success boosting the winners, um, and not so much failure discouraging the, the losers. And so in this case, but still I, I'm wondering whether that might not that might still be a little bit behavioral in a way. I mean, maybe success is actually validating your choices and that kind of encouraging you to actually do something. I don't know, I'm not a specialist in that uh, in that particular field, but it seems to me that if that was the case, so if even to some extent being awarded promotion was a booster, you would have somehow a low, uh, an upper bound uh, for just the impact of setting immediate uh, uh, incentives. So that's uh, one first remark. A second remark is a bit more, uh, you know, going going one, one step back. It's about really policy considerations. So in this paper, we are told basically that you have this fantastic tool that is for free. Huh? I mean, it's it's basically for free. I mean, you have to set up committee and all that, but it's not super costly, and that improves quite substantially actually the the output of of researchers. So I guess the question when we're there is always okay, but so why isn't it like absolutely all the time we're setting incentives to people? What are the costs? Okay, so what are the trade offs? Why isn't it just a, a, a no brainer? Uh, and obviously you can think of of different things. So either for instance people are going to focus on the incentives and they might substitute time. Uh, for, uh, across different tasks, okay, and neglect the tasks that are not incentivized. Uh, so, for instance, think teaching or think uh, all the admin tasks that people have to do, or maybe working collectively. Um, so, in a sense, the, you you probably want to incentivize people to some extent, and maybe right now I don't know what the situation in Italy, but maybe we are in a in a, in a setup where there are not enough incentives, but you also have probably a world where. Too many incentives are going really to distort completely the, the way people are going to allocate their time and effort and probably also work together. Um, and then the second one is also, and that's one that is actually tackled in the in the paper, is about the, the, the optimal incentive design in this setup, right? So, so you want probably to give the right incentives to the right people. So as as the as as exactly was said by, by Marco, probably if you want to give incentives that are too far away or too close, you're not going to incentivize people very much. So you really want to kind of fine tune that. Um, which brings me a little bit to the last point, which is more clarification, because I was not very, I mean, I probably I didn't understand very well what's going on in the in the on this result about the heterogeneity of the treatment effects. Um, so it seemed like there is a focus on one indicator out of the three. Um, because I mean, in this case, what what is going on is that you're doing RDD, right? So you're you're basically comparing people that you want to be as 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 close to each other as possible. So in order to generate the heterogeneity, you probably want to kind of take one indicator and let and and say, okay, I'm very far or I'm very or I'm very close on this indicator, but then the others are actually going to move. So. So in a sense, I mean, it's not that you take, you fix two indicators and you let one three. When you move one indicator, the others also have to move. Otherwise, you wouldn't necessarily have passed. Um, so it's a bit difficult to kind of follow. And also, it looks like there is some cross-field viability involved because you you uh, we want to compare basically the incentives are not necessarily to move across your field. So basically, the exercise is to say, um, I'm, I'm, I'm considering a field where the gap between the incentives in the associate and foo or in the assistant and associate are very far away and another field where they are quite close. And so the change when you go from one status to the other is going to create a change in incentives or not very much. And so it seems like there is some cross field variation that is involved. And I was not very sure whether we were completely fine about that. And then, I mean, there was the issue that the the confidence interval were were you know not super uh, not super tight. So, but I mean, overall, I think it's it. I I, I love the paper. I I think even this result is a great insight, and so I love it. Thank you very much. Thanks very much indeed. And um, so our second discussant is Andrea Teze. Let me stop sharing. Here we go. Thank you. Okay, can you see my slides? Yep, perfect, thank you. Okay, well, first of all, thank you very much to the organizers and the editors to give me the opportunity to read uh, 
this very interesting paper, I, I must say, and, and I agree, I concur with Roland, that's extremely well written. So by now, uh, you know the background, but let me give it once again. So this uh, paper is, is studying the effect of promoting incentives on performance in the public sector and specifically on, on academic performance. And so as the authors stress, this is important because in the public sector, there is uh, seldom the opportunity to have uh, wage flexibility. So really enhancing uh, uh, career perspectives, perspective seems to be the relevant margin to, to, to boost uh, the incentives. And so the context here is the, is the so-called Germini reform uh, of 2010 in Italy, uh, which introduced the NSC, N NSQ, the National Scientific Qualification, uh, which basically sets objective uh, thresholds to be fulfilled in order to pass to associate or full professor. And the three metrics are number of publications, citations, age index. This varies by, by fields. Now, there are several uh, sectors. The authors focus on, on so-called bibliometric sectors because it's really where these objective measures are, are there. And these, I, I, I took some numbers and, and covered around two thirds of, of academics in Italy. So I was initially, I mean, of course, out of sheer self-interest, I would be interested in, in knowing what happens in, in economics. But I do understand uh, why the authors went for the, for the bibliometric sectors, which are, of course, relevant. So in this context, then, um, by exploiting these different thresholds, uh, they run a FADSI RDD and basically study the effect of qualifying to associate on the research output of those that barely qualified as opposed to those who barely do not qualify. And in a nutshell, my reading of the main results is that those who barely qualify have 40% more publications than those that barely do not qualify in the following years. There is some effect on citations and there is no effect on, on, on quality of, of, of publications of those who made it. Now, the, the authors press and push very hard the interpretation that this is due to increasing incentives that are due to the possibility of applying for full professorship. So that these incentives are, are unlocked now because now it, you, can, you can look at this further step in your career ladder. So I think overall, this is a very nice paper on, on an important topic. I would also like to praise both the, the, the well, the authors, but also the, 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 the referees, if they are in the, in, the, in the audience, because I think it was a very nice review process. So I went through the reports and they were very, careful and thorough and, and yeah, and actually I think the paper improved because of them and the authors really made a great job in answering those, those remarks. So I think by now the paper is kind of convincing in terms of identifying assumptions and, and, and what the authors try to, to show. So my main comments are kind of simple comments on, on the interpretation uh, of the results and the overall evaluation of the report. So broad uh, kind of points. So the first point is that I want to make is that is in terms of the incentives that are at play and, and what shall be the interpretation of the result. So qualifying for associate professorship is by no means a sufficient condition for being awarded this associate professorship. So it's necessary, but not sufficient. Indeed, only one quarter of one fourth of those who qualified become associate three years after the NSQ of, of 2012. So you can really wait for a long time. You, you might become an associate, maybe you, you don't, but it will take some time. And so what is the elephant in the room, at least to me, is what happens after the qualification. So the, the, the centralized competition after qualification, you do qualify, fine, still, who are you competing with afterwards? Is it really that now what is unlocked is your next career step or that what is happening is that now you can participate in the competition to become an associate professor? So if we look by sector, okay, disaggregated results by sector, so the effect of barely qualifying as opposed to not by the different sectors, and of course here I'm cherry picking, but where the effect is really strong in physics, 
chemistry, as opposed to biology and physics, this of course means nothing, okay? It's not the variation the authors are exploiting, but if I match with the number, the percentage of those who qualify for associate by sector, you see that actually the effort, the, the differential is much larger where there is a high share of people who made it. So you can foresee a lot of competition even if you pass the threshold. Instead, very low rates of passing the threshold, so you can expect less competition, and there is not so much difference in, in the effort that the guys who made it in those sectors exert as opposed to those who didn't. Now, this is all just to say that maybe it's just a matter of how to interpret the, 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 the results. So in, in my impressions that I would place a little less emphasis on the fact that it opens up access to, to the full professorship, as much as, as I was saying, that it, it, it represents a minimum condition for competing with other candidates for the same position. And so in general, what I would do is to investigate further this decentralized competition after qualification. And this is important because I mean, it kind of gives you as well uh, 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 an overall view of, of this policy reform. So is it just that you need to unlock the next step and everybody's going to exert in, in the, the right incentives? Or on top of that, you need a certain threshold number of people who qualify so to exert enough competition, exposed, and so on and so forth. So I would look at the decentralized competition by sector, as I was hinting to in the previous slide, but also within department. So we, we don't know, there is very little, it comes very late in the paper, what's, what's the average number of qualified per department? Do guys who face competition within the department exert more effort after qualifying as opposed to those uh, who, I mean, they made it, because we know that typically once you, you, you get qualified, you're gonna be hired by your department typically. That happens in over 90% of the cases in Italy. And so I was wondering, you do some exercise on this, but it's using a very cold measure. I was wondering, I'm not an expert, so I'm, I'm definitely not an expert, but I think that using the punti organico that universities receive and that they have to allocate. So depending on how many punti organico universities get or how much hiring they can make, how, how much competition you can expect after qualifying. The second point, it again in the in the spirit of 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 of, of trying and understand the reform overall because you guys take an I think an implicitly sympathetic view of the reform so uh, you, you you get qualified you exert effort and and I'm not pro or against because again I'm just sheer ignorant on this but if I look at this at these thresholds say these are by sectors but what I notice is that the median this is this is plotting the median number of citation. So you need to be above the median in two out of three. And so if you focus on citations and articles in many sectors, the median number of citation to qualify for associate is 20. And the median number of, 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 of papers is 20. So, I mean, the, 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 on average, the, the, there are very few citations on these papers. So every form that increases the quantity, so you publish even more not necessarily well-cited papers. There is actually already kind of an abundance of papers as opposed to citations. A reform that increases quantity, but not quality, you do not find any effect on quality. My question is, is it is a good reform? I don't know, maybe there is an, maybe I'm okish here, but we are producing too much, who knows? So I would take a, a more than one takeaway from, from this. And just to, to, to conclude, I think for another paper, it would be interesting to understand the strategic decisions actually uh, post qualification of what these guys decide to do. But thank you very much. Um, thanks very much. We already have a few questions in the queue. So Marco, perhaps we can take a few questions and then, then you can sort of uh, respond to them and, 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 and the discussion. So, yeah, I'm get, gonna guess that we're gonna have lots of questions here. Um, so let, let me ask um, one for myself, first of all, which is, I think Roland mentioned the possibility that um, the people who just didn't make the threshold might be discouraged. And, you know, that is an alternative interpretation of a differential. And I mean, I'm wondering whether, 
you know, if you if you just don't make a threshold and it is actually really kind of random, you know, and you're going for this associate professor thing and you didn't make it and it was kind of random. I mean, is that the best frame of mind to be in then in terms of thinking about the incentives? You might say to yourself, well, you know, I was working hard, but you know, I just got unlucky and so on. So, um, I mean, I'm wondering whether the Roland's possibility is particularly apt in that context. That was my question. Um, Valeria. No, so Paolo is the first person up with a question. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. So uh, I was wondering whether when you get promoted, the only thing that really changes is uh, just your incentives, right? I mean, I can imagine what your salary would change. So maybe you may be more relaxed. And also, in some cases, maybe access to research funds or um, students, PhD students or things like that. So. Uh, for instance, uh, the, the PRIN, which is the main type of grant from the Italian government, can be accessed only uh, by associate professors and not for, by assistant professors, right? So this could be another treatment that you get on top of, uh, uh, of the incentive. Uh, and then, sorry, just a final remark. I mean, the, the conclusion about extending these results to other professions like uh, judges or people like that. I mean, this was very optimistic. Uh, I'm just a bit worried that, I mean, in this case, the, the real peculiarity is that you have transparent rules and also a very transparent outcome that you can measure, which is citations or publication, whatever. So the problem for most type of public jobs in evaluating them and monitoring them is that really we don't have an objective measure like this. So nobody really knows whether a sentence by a judge is a good sentence or a bad sentence. But yeah, this is just about a, a very final conclusion of the paper. Thank you. Okay, Valeria has a question. Valeria Merlo. Thanks. Yeah, the first question is something that I probably missed. How you, um, how you um, think about dynamics. Uh, you see the threshold um, met or not met just at one point, and then you compare afterwards. Um, does it, matter whether those who barely didn't make it make it two years afterwards and are you still are they still in the control group or can you check their performance two years later um, and then the second question was related to what paolo um, just said um, i was thinking are they really comparable i was more thinking about signaling if you're in a, a young person in a department and there are more senior people who might want to work with you because you signal that you're going uh, to make it, yes? And this is something that you could look um, because you have the information on co-authors, for example. I was wondering if you, if you looked into that, yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, Emmerich. Yeah, so thanks a lot for the interesting paper. So I was uh, the same line a bit uh, about external validity. So uh, it's, a, so it's a, we're a weird profession with potentially uh, intrinsic motivation, peer effects, etc. I guess they're more or less present in different departments, but still they exist. Um, so how, what do we really learn about other uh, public uh, servants uh, or uh, or public service, yeah. And the second thing is about uh, what Roland mentioned about when you put a criterion, you tend to decrease potentially your effort on other dimensions. And I was wondering on one that Roland didn't mention, which is uh, uh, long-term projects and originality, and which is something that typically you can measure in these bibliometric uh, 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 data. And so I wondered if you looked at that and, and, and what, it, what it provided. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, so just a question about the um, the objectivity of the measure. So, I mean, you're, you're focusing on these objective measures, but we, we know from recent work, like work by Manuel Vargas and co-authors that um, for this exact uh, sort of uh, evaluation uh, system, the composition of the committee mattered for the outcome. I mean, they're focusing on the gender composition and and in determining uh, who, who kind of goes through. But I wonder if this is an issue here uh, with what you're doing. Thanks very much. Um, and, and Dennis has a question, Dennis Novi. Yes, thank you. Uh, Roland mentioned earlier, somewhat fleetingly, that this is almost free, a free tool for a policymaker. Um, well, it costs admin, but I think what it does probably mean is, 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 as Paula just mentioned, is higher salaries, right? So there's a, there's a, there's a monetary cost for, for the policymaker. And I was wondering from the policy point of view, 
if you want to implement this, right? I mean, how much does this scheme cost compared to other schemes? For example, monetary incentives. If you just pay people money for reaching certain targets, not necessarily promoting them. But I was wondering whether it makes sense, whether that question even makes sense and you could say something along those lines comparing this particular policy to others. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I don't see any other immediate questions. So Marco, do you want to respond to anything that you've heard? Yes. Okay, so uh, I, I start from around comment. I, I really thank you for, for your comment. Um, so one, this, this the argument about the lower bounds and the, the upper bound of what we find. So in terms of the lower bound, one thing is that uh, the applicants have somehow to rely on the stability of this process. So if you think about, of course, if you consider their whole career, they may have incentive at a certain point to reach the full professor qualification. But in, like in the horizon we are considering, at the end in, in which you think this system will be stable with that cutoff, you have a promotion bar, and then what you try to do is to try to exert effort to, to reach it. And from the other side, from like the upper bound, uh, the fact that maybe this is also like a boosting effect of uh, getting the promotion. This is actually what we try to discard with our analysis of full professors, for instance, that also they should have a boosting effect and, and they don't. And also about this uh, uh, with our u shape evidence. So from here, I will try to, to jump more on the details about this, how this U-shape effect is computed. So we are actually exploiting two sources of variation. One is the source of variation you mentioned, the fact that because of the structural differences between fields, in some fields, you have a relatively close uh, distance uh, from the full professor threshold is relatively close in some other is relatively far away. But also we are looking at articles because for, um, from our perspective, this is the indicator is a bit more under your control. So citation is something you receive in each index as well. But while articles is somehow the number of articles you, you try to produce, et cetera. But also we are exploiting the fact that you may be at the same point of the distance from the full professor threshold, but like you also may be located in different space in terms of citation at in each index. So we are using both these sources of heterogeneity, this field-based uh, heterogeneity, and also how you are located uh, in terms of the other running variables. Um, also to, to a test for this is that we estimate the same U-shape equation for the pre and SQ period and like it's a flat line. So we don't see that we are capturing something specific of the, of the field, for instance. Um, in terms of like the incentives design, I agree. So there is like, you, you can open up the part and check how they are doing with the teaching or answering other questions, how they are doing with these long-term projects. Um, so this is, I mean, in principle, the teaching was part of our analysis, but it's very hard to get the objective data on the quality of teaching. Otherwise, it would be the natural idea to check which are the consequences on, on, on other tasks. And about um, how to design, so our, they are not direct policy implication, but a, an important point that you mentioned is what is the, in, the, in, in, the interpretation in terms of the optimal incentive design? For instance, how many career ladders should we design? And how should we set this threshold? Should we set, uh, in principle, what you can say is that you, you may want to have more ladders and, and more threshold because then in this way, you also trigger the margin of those who are maybe too close or, or too far. But I mean, this is a bit speculative with, with, the, with the result we have. So I hope I didn't forget many things. I move to Andrea's uh, point. So for the decentralized competition, the short answer is that this measure that we are using, and it is a measure that is showing that we, we do not see a clear pattern in terms of uh, uh, how, whether this, this impact on productivity depends on how crowded is your department, our best measure, uh, the measure we had was this measure that you have a, a field times university unit. And this somehow in our, from our perspective should resemble the um, competition. Um, so should resemble the department unit. So economics in, in Cagliari, for instance, or medicine in Cagliari. And 
in also this this is uh, something that we do not see for full professor so this should happen as well for full professor so they also have to compete for getting at the decentralized stage a full professorship and we we still do not find evidence that then that this is happening so this is somehow clashing i mean from the best we can do um okay so in terms of whether this is something that we want uh, that we have more quantity versus uh, with the same level of quality. And I don't have an answer for this. I think we, 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 we see that we, given the status quo, we have a better situation in terms of more papers and this doesn't come at the expenses of their quality. Of course, then you can think, how would you design in, in the best way this cutoff, this threshold? So should we, if we want also to, explicitly foster quality, maybe you should uh, try to introduce some more directly observable measures of, of quality. And then if our results can be extended, you should also, you may also observe a productivity effect in terms of the quality of the journal, because the only incentivized measure is citation that is not exactly a, like a super neat uh, proxy of, of journal quality. Um, so um, what about the discourage, um, I, sorry, I, don't, I didn't remember who asked this question about whether these, these results may be driven by discouraged um, applicants. It looks like it's not. So we have like this, this result on the fact that the marginal applicant doesn't not reduce the application. Also, we have additional result that says, that shows that uh, we don't observe a dropout and we don't observe an increase in those who publish zero publication, which is a broad proxy of those who leave academia. Um, okay, so about actual promotion, that is something I, um, so the, the effect of being, of getting that our results can be interpreted as the effect of accessing more funds or teaching duties, so, or, or, or higher wage. One important thing is that our results um, uh, is there even before the actual promotion. So is only getting, already getting the eligibility for a promotion that is boosting your productivity. And so actually for in 2013 and 14, we already observed the result, but none of our applicants actually get the promotion. So nothing changed in terms of access to fund or uh, wages or visibility in terms of being a, associate professor. So they are still assistant professor who now have the associate professor qualification and can apply to the full professor qualification. And of course they will get it uh, much later on. Um, okay, so we may be a bit optimistic about the external validity of these uh, policies, but if you think about it, it's not very uncommon that in other contexts such as judges, you have similar measures. I. I found that, for instance, for some labor um, judges in Germany, they also have measures that are based on the number of cases that are um, re rebounded by, by the next court. And, and this, is, this enters directly, uh, the, this enters directly their, their evaluation process. So already, it's not that we are proposing to introduce this system. In many cases, these systems are already there. Try to to introduce objective measures of, of productivity. Um, so to Valeria, our research idea is, um, is actually based on the fact that the only thing that is uh, changing is that these guys have, are almost identical between them. Um, and then the only difference between them is that there is a tiny difference in terms of uh, their uh, data research production pre reform. So uh, also this should speak to the answer of uh, Gazaya, sorry if I misspelled your, your name, that of course we are aware that there is this selectivity of committees that may favor male candidates or candidates that are more similar to them, but the only source of variation we are using in this case are these differences in these measures that are predetermined. So we are only using this difference to estimate the effect uh, in terms of later promotion incentives. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sure I may have missed someone. That's, that's um, okay. Okay. That's okay. Sorry. 
Yeah. Um, I think it's we're out of time anyway. So I think and I think it's a good note. We have sort of 20 minutes now for a break. Uh, so thank, thank you very much indeed, Marco. So we we'll reconvene at uh, 1340 uh, Brussels time uh, to listen to Martin Rebellion. OK, see you then. Thank you. Okay, I think it's um, time to begin. If everybody's re if everybody's ready, are are you ready, Martin? Yes, I'm ready. Okay, great. Well, why don't why don't we start then? Um, so we can all have a break before the policy session. Um, so so you have twenty minutes, uh, Martin, and then there'll be two discussions of ten minutes each, and then there'll be fifteen okay. minutes for general questions. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Kevin, and and thank you for the to the organisers of this. Uh, Economic Policy Panel, the 74th, amazing. Um, thank you for inviting us to do this. Uh, thank you for our referees on the paper. Thank you in advance to our discussants. And thank you all for attending. Uh, this is joint work with Michael Lockshin, who is hopefully here now. I just sent him a wake-up call. Um, it's morning in Washington. Not too early, but uh, there we go. Everybody see that all right? Let me just make it. Looks good. Looks good. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, um, this started um, a discussion over lunch, uh, Misha and I had, and we were sort of wondering how do we, we, we knew this research show, showing the, the huge uh, losses from restrictions on migration, economic losses globally. Um, very convincing work, we thought. But uh, our question in this discussion was, how do we put something on the table, a bit, a bit more creative maybe, uh, about what we can do to, to, to make, um, make workers, immigrant workers, as popular as tourists in a, in a rich country? Uh, we clearly needs to be a quid pro quo. There's something's got to give here. We've got to make migrants more popular in the home country. Um, just uh, to remind you of some of that research, uh, this is a quote from Michael Clements uh, here in DC in the Center for Global Development. Trillion dollar bills on the sidewalk, a reference to uh, some of the evidence, including his, his paper in Ari Stat a couple of years ago with, um, with others, uh, estimating a mean price equivalent of restrictions of migration, which is about $20,000 per worker per year globally. Uh, you know, there are a lot of issues here about how you control for observables and unobserv how you deal with unobservable heterogeneity and all that. I'm not going to go into it. Um, at the same time, we've also got this large illegal unmanaged migration industry. I became very aware of this myself when I was visiting the University of Malaya just prior to the uh, COVID. And, and um, you know, I was collecting some evidence on the, the huge rents. You know, the, uh, Malaysia is a big attractor of migrants within the region from Bangladesh, Nepal, elsewhere. Um, and the, the rents are incredible. Um, factor of 10 times, you know, they're paying out money, these migrants are paying out money, factor of 10 times the, um, the accountable costs in airfare, passports, medical checkups, fees, all of that stuff. Um, we also see a lot of issues about infringement on workers' rights, issues all the way from the um, restrictions on the unionization, lack of redress, harassment, sexual violence, whipping, caning. I mean, there's a, and, it, and it's well documented and it, it's pretty horrible. Um, at the same time, we've got this strong, opposi this strong opposition to removing restrictions. And, and we all know that. I mean, one of the things that prompted this discussion for to Misha and I that started all this, this paper were, was, um, this realization within the United States and the, the nature of the opposition and the way it's also used. It's, it's not a simple thing of economic losses. It's a, a more complex um, kind of opposition. Uh, 
Um, there are strong perceptions of negative, negative externalities for, for, of the, among the native population. But also a lot of horizontal differences. The average, there may be an average gain from migrants, but there are losers and there as well as gainers, of course. Um, COVID has made a lot of this even more uh, worrying. So here's the policy challenge. What, what can we do? Um, I emphasize that we're, we're just trying to put something on the table. We're, we're hoping to kind of get a, a discussion going. Uh, there's a literature we're drawing on, on, on the particular kind of approach we, we follow here. But the essential policy challenge, how do, we, how do we try and pick up those trillion dollar bills on the sidewalk, or at least some of them? Uh, and obviously equity, concerns about inequality are going to be prominent in how we think about this. This is not just a story about efficiency. Okay, um, I don't have much time. I'm going to just quickly outline the idea. I'm going to give you a little sketch of the proposal in theory. That'll be a, a super stripped down model. The, the paper's got a much richer model with lots of costs of migration and so on. Um, and we're working on, on empirical impl implementation as well. Um, I won't be discussing that. I, I won't have time. Empirical implementation is for the United States versus and Mexico. Um, then I'll say a bit about the proposal and practice, how it would be implemented, and finally some conclusions. And I do recommend, it's a shame how much I have to cut to, in this story for this presentation, but the full paper has a lot more detail. So essentially, we, we see it as a missing market. There are, there are citizens, they have a right to take a job in their, in their country. Uh, that comes with their citizenship. Um, call it the citizenship work permit. Currently, this is non-marketable. You can't sell it. You can't rent it out. And our question is, well, why? Uh, that's the, the arguably the main asset of poor and middle-income people in, in rich countries, and it's not monetized. It can't be monetized. I'm going to emphasize the difference between renting it out and selling it. We don't think selling it would make much sense, but renting it out, why do we have this restriction? At the same time, on the other side of this missing market, the missing market for work permits, um, we have foreigners who, who want jobs in those countries and they can't get them. Our proposal in a nutshell is that um, every citizen in rich countries, I'm getting a bit of interference from somebody on the, from the, um, has got their microphone on, but, um, uh, we argued a citizenship, citizenship, citizenship would be free to rent out her, her work permit for a period of her choice and rent it back at any time. Foreigners rent work permits for a period of their choice. Um, there's, it's, it's only a time-bound temporary work permit that we're talking about. We're not talking about selling citizenship, buying citizenship. Uh, the renter can take any job offer in the country within the contracted period. There's no one-to-one -one matching here. It's not like I have to find a buyer for my work permit. We just treat it as a, as a market. Um, there's no one-to-one -one matching. The equilibrium price in that market is going to equate aggregate supply and demand measured in time units over some period. It doesn't have to clear every minute of every day. You could think of some market clearing period. All right. The market is, is fully disembodied from the persons renting out their rights. So it's an anonymous market. It can be taxed. And actually, we argue taxing this market, uh, taxing the work permits in this market could be a, uh, a very good idea, especially initially, but for other reasons we're going to talk about. Uh, and there can be eligibility restrictions. Uh, the market doesn't have to be just one price. Uh, you could differentiate it by occupation. You could differentiate, but geographically, you may have some region, some lagging poor area in the high income country that could benefit from this. Um, we also emphasize that thinking about this, there are pros and cons. It's, it's not a, a slam dunk at all. Um, we think there are advantages, internalizing externalities associated with the migrants, making migrate, mig internal migration more popular. Uh, People in the, in the host country will, will have a new opportunity for social protection. Uh, if they, they want to stop work and look after the elderly grandmother, they can do it through this policy. If they uh, want to um, go back to school, uh, retool, um, invest in a new self-employment enterprise, we've got to, for which they've got to get some skills going, uh, all kinds of opportunities will be created by this within the host country. And we think that would be a, a source of popularity. But there will be issues too. Uh, um, there could be implications for the labor market. Uh, 
Um, how you design the scheme, there are many options here. You could make it fairly neutral with respect to the wage distribution, but then you'd have to differentiate the work permits quite a bit. Uh, certainly, if you just had one price, one work permit, um, clearing the market, um, you're going to have uh, implications within the uh, to the distribution of income within the country, within the host country. And most importantly, in our view, you're going to raise the floor. You're going to provide a, a, a minimum earnings uh, uh, to everybody in the country, which is the price of the work permit. We can imagine all the things that you can do with it. I mentioned some of these already. Uh, home care, care cope with, uh, with unemployment shocks, um, new businesses, et cetera. Um, I want to say a little bit about the, the rights aspect of this. I mean, you know, I, I'm a classic consequentialist economist, but I, I, I'm kind of respectful of rights-based arguments. Um, and, and here, I think there's a glaring question that I highlight here. Why should this freedom to rent out your work permit as a, a citizen of a high-income country, why do we restrict that? And, and we can't think of a particularly good reason. We can think of good reasons why you wouldn't want to sell it. You wouldn't want to let people sell their citizenship right. But the idea of renting it out and renting it back as you see fit, uh, we're not really sure why um, this is um, the case. Um, I've said this. Um, we also realise that, um, and this is definitely, as I right from the start said, that this is... Um, coming also from a realization how badly migrants, particularly undocumented migrants, are treated in, in the host countries at times, the, the kinds of discrimination I, I emphasized, I pointed to. And these are important concerns about human rights uh, as well. Um, we argue in this type of scheme, essentially everybody in, who's working in, in the host country would have to have their work permit, including citizens, because you, know, you have to establish that you haven't rented out your work permit, so to get a job, you have to have your work permit. But everybody would be treated the same way. There'd be no differentiation under the law, under labor laws between citizen workers and temporary migrants from elsewhere. Uh, that would help. We're not saying it's going to solve all the problems, but it would certainly help, we believe, in, in addressing these concerns about uh, the treatment of, of migrants in host countries. Um, just a quick sketch of the theoretical model. Um, enforcement is, a, is going to be an issue. Um, we emphasize that you don't need full enforcement. Partial enforcement is going to actually eliminate, under certain conditions, you can eliminate the, the illegal migration through um, uh, partial enforcement. Uh, of course, that assumes that there are costs, as we know, there are large costs to migrants from uh, illegal migration. Um, given that, uh, there's going to be some critical, let me just uh, put my little pen on. Um, you know, as long as the probability of getting caught, that's the probability of being caught in the, in the host country and deported, as long as it's greater than one minus the cost of that, uh, the upfront cost per, per worker of illegal migration as a proportion of the price of the work permit, that's going to be the key condition. As long as you can enforce sufficiently by that condition, illegal migration will disappear. The market will wipe out the, the formal market will wipe out the illegal market. Now, I, I'm, we don't know if that condition uh, can be attained. Uh, it doesn't seem impossible. Um, but the point I'm only making this in this right now, theoretically, is that it doesn't have to have full enforcement. Um, in a, the simplest possible model, basically just uh, solving for the, the price that equates the demand and supply for, for these work permits. Um, if there's no frictions and no cost of migration, no taxes and so on, uh, then this price will be pretty high. You can pretty quickly establish the, the price, the equilibrium price will be the point on the quantile function corresponding to the share of the population in a low wage country. Uh, that's a big number. Um, the, quant the, the quantile function here is the, is the distribution of wages in the high wage country. Um, but as soon as you introduce costs of migration, and we've got a more, much more elaborate discussion of this in the paper. Uh, this cost is going to, the price is going to fall quite a bit. Our simulations, uh, the, Me the US Mexico case suggested a lot. I mean, you can reason that you can get this price down to a, a, quite a moderate level, but it's not going to be negligible. It could be in the US, it could be talking easily about uh, 10, $15,000 a year. Um, we also emphasize that there's a, a role here for social protection. And here we need the, the idea of the inverse of this problem. Instead of just solving uh, 
for this market equilibrium, we ask what if you have a desired price, and that desired price is a is, could be considered a normative thing. It's uh, the desired minimum level of earnings in the host country, and for well over a hundred years, um, rich countries, rich countries by today's standards, have had policies to try to achieve such a minimum level of earnings. Obviously, um, minimum wage legislation, but um, various forms of of um, guaranteed minimum income and so on. Um, these things have been around for a while. Uh, this would be a policy that would guarantee that, in, at least in terms of the earnings distribution, I emphasize the earnings distribution. Um, so if you think that the government has some um, um, socially optimal level of the floor to living standards, you know, it solves this problem for optimal distribution and you look at the lower bound of that optimum. I'm getting little buzzes about time. I've got to close them. Um, then you can solve this inverse problem, find the, the uh, tax on the work permits, which would achieve the desired minimum income in the host country, the socially optimal minimum income. And we, we talk about how you do that, and it's not terribly difficult. Quickly, how we might do it in practice. Well, essentially, you, you, you create a website, and um, anybody who wants to rent out goes to this website, has to validate their, their do the usual obvious validations. And other people who want to rent a work permit go to this website. Um, we can talk, think about how to clear it in various ways, but an obvious solution would be thinking about it as, a, as a, this kind of auction. Um, and the auction, uh, the price that emerges out of this auction uh, equates uh, demand and supply over some reasonable period of time. And there are other ways of doing it. Um, you know, Misha and I, I think have, Michael Lockshaw and I have somewhat different views of this. He's, he's really seems to be keen on this eBase type auction. Um, I prefer this simple um, form of auction that I described here, but there are many ways of doing it. A couple of comments. How does this differ from a universal basic income? Um, well, it's, it's obviously U, a UBI has to be financed. This doesn't have, this is financed internally. It's entirely financed by the uh, prices you sell work permits for. Um, it's also also the the um, market for work permits social policy is self-targeted. Anybody who, who poorer workers will tend to take it up, um, but it's available to everybody. It's universal in access, uh, but for obvious reasons, you're going to tend to have lower. You're almost certainly going to have poorer workers taking it up. Um, okay, a few points to conclude. Um, this is uh, we see as this both of, I see as this is both a way of managing migration and, and achieving some uh, of the gains from migration, uh, but also in a way that provides a, a new opportunity for social protection in rich countries and in many countries, and certainly this one, uh, the United States, that is a, an issue. Um, it can be done in a way that uh, is neutral with respect to aggregate, um, the aggregate amount of employment in the host country, um, or you can make it neutral with respect to employment across particular uh, sectors. You can also integrate it into manpower policy if you've got a certain desired, like when I was working in Malaysia, uh, um, if you've got a certain desired manpower policy, uh, you know, it's a quaint word, manpower, I guess we should drop that, but you yes, know what I mean. You have a distribution of occupations in the country, a desired distribution of occupations, and a country like Malaysia is going to be importing labor for a long time. Um, then you can use this policy, solving this problem, this, pro this market equilibrium for different for different types of occupations, consistent with your manpower policy. A lot of opportunities there. Um, I think I've said most of this. Um, importantly, I think this idea of making making uh, migrants more popular in host countries. It's certainly something where we, we think would have appeal. Uh, within the low wage economy, um, you know, both Misha and I work on work a lot on poverty in, in developing countries. And I've worked on that for most of my professional career. Uh, we don't seeing this as a, a solution to the problem of poverty in developing countries. You know, I think other instruments will be needed. There would certainly be first order welfare gains to those who would otherwise not get a work permit within the um, low wage economy, and that's a clear thing. It's going to be probably middle to high skill labor that is attracted by this policy, given that the, you have to buy a temporary work permit and it's not going to be that cheap. Um, there'll be implications for remittances, of course. Uh, 
uh, returns to education will most certainly increase within low wage economies. Um, we'd also see less of a pressure. I mean, every developing country I've worked on has got is worried about unemployed, um, skilled but unemployed uh, young people. We've got a, a, an answer to that problem. Um, concerns about brain drain would arise, but we also think, and I think much of the literature suggests, the brain drain, brain drain concerns are rather exaggerated in a lot of this discussion. Uh, very finally, um, a few research issues going forward. Um, depending on the design, uh, we, we'd, we would like to see or do or some general equilibrium modeling of the impact of the proposal. I think that would be wise. Um, I think in implementation, it would be very wise to, to start with a high tax and bring it down to see what, what would be happening. Even if you've done a, a really good uh, modeling of this thing, um, you're going to have a lot of uncertainty. Um, issues that we find would be important, understanding the costs of illegality better, are partly why I was looking into this in Malaysia. Um, this is a, a key parameter. Um, we know a bit. It's not, it's not the easiest thing to find out about, obviously. Um, we think there's scope for, for uh, evaluative work, or RCTs on access to work permits of, uh, among undocumented migrants and refugees. Uh, some randomised prices might be used. Uh, and, of course, the idea of a pilot maybe in some locality um, with uh, both refugees and citizens. Okay, folks, I nailed it, I think, 20 you minutes. Did, yeah. Absolutely brilliant. Thanks very much. I appreciate Thank you. that. Uh, okay, first up is Gabrielle. Okay, Gabrielle. thank you. Let me share my screen. Uh, is it fine? Yep. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, discuss this paper. So uh, as, as I must say as a disclaimer that I am not uh, an expert in immigration or labor market, but uh, I guess, I mean, the, poly the, the paper is uh, uh, relatively easy to understand. And I think it's a very nice paper and uh, trying to tackle a very important question and uh, making very, uh, interesting proposal, even though it's a quite a bold proposal. Uh, so uh, let me just, uh, so, so I think it's, it was very interesting and very stimulating. And uh, I, I'm going to make a, a, a few comments on the paper, uh, maybe a bit naive, but uh, uh, I, I hope it, it can be discussed. And, uh, and maybe uh, uh, the, the comments I'm doing, maybe in a more, uh, Kind of refined version of the of the proposal, it could be addressed. So, uh, so just to go back to the overall uh, paper. So basically, the problem is that uh, despite high overall potential gains to migration, there is resistance uh, to large migration flows in many host countries. And so, the idea is how can we try to address this problem? And so, the the proposal of uh, the paper is to make the right to work. Uh, in a country, a temporary tradable asset for citizens of the, those countries that they can actually trade uh, on a market for work permits. And in actually, at least in the very simple uh, model uh, where you actually have one market, uh, what uh, you would have is that uh, the sellers uh, of the permits are going to be relatively low wage earners from host countries because uh, of course, um, you have to be, uh, when the price is going to, uh, to be set in equilibrium, uh, in order to be willing to sell your permit, it has to be profitable for you. And so uh, it's mainly uh, uh, workers uh, whose wages are lower that are going to find it profitable to uh, sell their right to work. And on the other hand, uh, those who are going to find it profitable to actually buy these work permits are more likely to be middle to high skilled uh, temporary migra migrants, otherwise it's not profitable to actually uh, buy the permit. Uh, so that's my understanding. So you have basically, uh, you, you, create a, a, you, you create a solution to a problem of uh, migration of high skilled workers. And uh, at the same time, you uh, give some compensation to low skilled workers. Uh, and so the idea is that since uh, potential losers from higher migration flows would be uh, compensated, 
then uh, it would make the policy uh, more uh, politically feasible because more people will support uh, this type of migration policies. At least that's my understanding. Uh, so uh, the uh, potential gains from the policy are the gains from the temporary migration of high skilled workers to host countries and potentially, so it's what is less clear is what could be the effect on uh, countries where uh, where there might be some brain drain, but there is this idea that since it's temporary, it's not uh, necessarily a problem in the long run. Uh, and then, so there is also the, this creation of a mechanism for a direct compensation of low skilled workers. Uh, so which means that uh, you don't need to have a, a social safety net that would be as large as if this does not exist. And there is also the potential gain of a decrease in illegal migration uh, since the expected value of legal migration becomes higher than the value of illegal, illegal migration. So it decreases uh, uh, illegal migration. Uh, so that's kind of the way I understand the gains from the policy. Uh, now, what uh, like I was trying to think from the uh, perspective of my country, which is French, France, where basically the problem seems to be more a problem that uh, there, there is very limited migration, but the migration is mainly uh, from uh, not so high skilled workers. And so people have been basically arguing that the problem uh, is more that uh, the migration flows are not targeted toward high school workers. So the, here, my question more generally is like, uh, maybe this is a nice way to deal with the migration of high skilled workers, but uh, is it going to tackle the overall question of migration and in particular the migration and often illegal, uh, illegal migration of low skilled workers? Uh, this is, uh, I'm not sure that the policy might uh, help us to really deal with this type of problems. But let me just enter a little bit into the detail and I try to question a little bit the kind of potential gains from the policy. So the first idea is that uh, like the, 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 the starting point of the paper is that uh, mig migration flows were uh, uh, too uh, small compared to what would be uh, beneficial uh, across countries. And so uh, the first question is, would the proposed policy actually increase migration flows? And uh, I think it's not clear because uh, the uh, total amount of work permits distributed is a result of the equilibrium in the market for work permits, which depends on demand and supply. And in particular, there are some kind of external factors that might affect supply. In particular, uh, the total number of permits distributed is going to matter. Uh, and preferences between work and leisure of the citizen in the host country are going to matter for the uh, final uh, equilibrium. And uh, the question I, I was uh, asking myself is, should we let the number of work permits depend on these factors? And more generally, uh, if you think about, uh, if you try to have an idea of like, uh, given the benefits of migration for the society, what could be the optimal uh, level uh, of migration from society's perspective? Uh, there is no reason to expect that uh, the equilibrium number of permits that is going to be sold is going to be equal to this potentially socially optimal level of permits. So, of course, here it means that uh, uh, one, one way where the governments could potentially uh, try to uh, regulate the whole market to uh, have the two things uh, coincide would be by re regulating the total number of permits distributed. Uh, if they know basically the preferences of the population, but this means that uh, it puts restric restrictions on, on who can actually sell the pre permits. And so that's a, a question. Um, then would the pro proposed policy be, be uh, more politically feasible? Uh, so in the models, those who are compensated for immigration are low skilled workers, but actually uh, those who are going to lose from the uh, immigration of a higher skilled worker are going to be uh, middle or high skilled workers in the host countries. And so you could expect that uh, maybe the migration of these very high skilled workers might actually be beneficial for everyone. And, uh, and, and so then, then there is no problem. But if it uh, creates a, a downward pressure on wages of uh, high skilled workers, uh, then uh, those workers might uh, start uh, uh, being uh, less favorable to migration because uh, those are going to be the one uh, directly affected by uh, 
by the uh, by the policy in a very simple model. And so uh, in the in the paper, uh, there is a discussion on uh, how uh, permits uh, can be taxed so that uh, some of the surplus can be actually redistributed to uh, middle to high skilled workers that could be uh, potentially uh, having some wage loss. The question is, is it actually feasible to fully compensate high skilled workers for a wage loss? And if not, then uh, could it actually generate a, a new opposition to a migration policy? Uh, then there is a question of, would the proposed policy reduce illegal immigration? So uh, I understood that basically there is a trade-off for migrants between uh, legal and illegal. And since uh, uh, when you have uh, access to a work permit, then uh, it makes illegal immigration much less uh, desirable. Uh, but the problem is that uh, if I go back to the problem of low-skilled low uh, immigrants, then they are probably uh, unlikely to buy permits because they are credit constrained probably and also uh, the permits are going to be too expensive given the expected returns. Uh, then, uh, on the other hand, if you have uh, many uh, low uh, skilled workers in the host country uh, who sell their permit to work, you have a shortage of uh, a low skilled, I mean, of, uh, of people who are willing to work in low skilled jobs. So it will put uh, uh, pressure to increase the wage. Uh, uh, in low-skilled occupations, and it might actually maybe trigger uh, more illegal uh, migration uh, from uh, low-skilled low workers. So is it possible, is it something that is uh, uh, that can be uh, dealt in the model? I mean, of course, you can imagine that you uh, increase, uh, uh, you increase um, uh, enforcement, but still you might want to actually have some uh, uh, low-skilled workers as well uh, to, to to take, given the shortage of low skill, of low skill uh, uh, labor supply in, uh, in uh, the hot countries. And then, so the remaining questions very shortly. So one is basically, uh, would the policy really benefit host citizens? So there is this idea that if they sell their permits, uh, they will have this extra uh, income from, uh, from the sale of the permit. This should be temporary. And one question is more behavioral. Uh, maybe uh, some people do not expect the temporary, the, the, the negative effect of uh, temporary work interruptions. And so uh, uh, how to make uh, sure that, this that everybody internalizes uh, the effect uh, of not working for a certain period of time. So it can be beneficial if people have uh, particular projects to implement, but uh, not always. Uh, and then the last uh, point I wanted to discuss is the relation between work permits and citizenship. Uh, because uh, if you think about migration, you think that some migrants who really like the country, they might want to stay in the host country and apply for citizenship. And uh, actually there are some papers that show that granting citizenship can be linked to better integration in the host country. However, if you think about uh, citizenship, if now citizenship gives you the right to uh, sell your uh, permit for work, uh, then it means that uh, it becomes an asset uh, that is more valuable if fewer people have citizenship. So you could expect that uh, this would, there would be this kind of political economy consequence that people uh, in the host country would be willing to sell temporary uh, work permits, but we want to reduce uh, the number of uh, migrants that would actually get citizenship. And uh, then uh, what would be like the consequences of having like an increase in temporary migration, but restricting uh, severely the possibility to actually uh, uh, integrate fully for my migrants and, and get the, the citizenship. Okay. So these are kind of the, the question I had, and I'm going to stop here. Uh, but yeah. it's uh, very, uh, I mean, uh, it made me uh, think a lot about these uh, policies and it was uh, very, uh, uh, very interesting. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, Paolo is up next, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, if you could, um, yeah, great. Yeah, great. Okay, so um, 
thanks a lot for the opportunity of reading this very nice paper and, and discussing it. So I really like the paper in, in the sense it's, it's very polished. Um, you, uh, I mean, you can see that there was a lot of thinking put into that. And I have to say, I like the presentation even more because it was actually also very engaging. So um, I wonder what a, something like this first example, or even more can be put in the, in the, the motivation of the paper. I mean, there's already some of it, but uh, I really like the, the presentation, yeah. So uh, since I'm the second discussant and uh, we are also a bit late, uh, I'm gonna be quick on, 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 on the summary. Uh, basically, it's a new proposal of a market for working permits, like it was said many times before, you rent the right to work, you cannot really sell it, or you cannot, even less, you can sell citizenship, of course. Uh, there's a decentralized supply of working permits from all the citizens in the, in the US country, and the market is anonymous. And the main advantages over previous proposals that I had seen, I mean, there, there are some of uh, some related proposals that have been discussed in, in, by economists in, in the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, I think the main advantages of, of this one is that it allows for a faster adaptation of the quantity and price of permit to changing economic conditions. Uh, moreover, it helps spreading uh, directly the economic windfall from migration, and this is possibly going to uh, increase political support uh, for migration. And finally, it provides uh, as a side effect, but I mean, not so side effect, it's an important effect, an insurance mechanism for native workers. Okay, so in, in periods of high unemployment, you can sell your, uh, you can rent, sorry, your working right, and, and you get implicitly an insurance against unemployment. Now, uh, the paper, as I said, it yeah, I mean, it, it, it's ready, I think, to be published. I think there are just some issues that could be discussed more or some caveats that could be added. Uh, so the first one is externalities. And, and this is a bit uh, related to what Gabriel was saying before, right? So I think on the one hand, the beauty of the system is that it's a market, right? So uh, you don't wanna put too much government intervention into that because otherwise you get back to government fixing the number of residence permits, the quotas of residence permits, and you're back to you know the, the standard migration policies that there are in place now. Uh, but then, I mean, we know from basic uh, Econ 101 that the market is gonna be good as long as there are not really externalities or as long as people internalize the, the cost of their action. So imagine just, just a very simple example, right? So imagine that uh, native people in rural areas, they rent permits to immigrants, working permit to immigrants, and then these immigrants, they go disproportionately to crowded, crowded metropolitan areas, right? So in this case, it's not really clear that the, num I mean, the, the supply uh, of permits in equilibrium is going to be the one maximizing the social welfare, right? So you discuss a lot of these compensation schemes, taxation and stuff, but in some of these cases, I guess it's, it's, it's quite, it's kind of hard, right, to decide who's going to be compensated. I mean, uh, this is just an example, right, uh, about um, workers in urban areas, but you can think about many cases that are hard to define exactly. Uh, second issue that I, I, I was wondering more from a political perspective, so I guess the host country government should uh, relinquish control over the aggregate supply of residence permits. Again, it's part of the beauty of this new system, but on the other hand, this is a strong limitation of the sovereign, uh, well, not really the sovereign, because, but it's, it's a big transfer of power from the central government to people. To, to you know to the citizens of this country uh, maybe it's even a good thing but i'm just wondering whether it's it's feasible or not whether governments are really gonna be willing to uh, to allow for that uh, the second issue is that uh, social insurance would be, would be pro-cyclical right so you have high unemployment uh, 
In this period, the supply of working permits would increase, the price of permits would decrease. So uh, the native workers, they would get fewer money from this social insurance mechanism, exactly in periods in which unemployment is high, which is the opposite of what you would like uh, from a social insurance mechanism. Now, you mentioned this issue, you are aware of this, you mentioned this on, on page 19 of the paper, but it, I think it would be good to elaborate a bit more on, on, yeah, on, on the limitation of this system as a social insurance scheme. Uh, then, I think these two limitations, uh, uh, I mean, they, they, they are part of the game, right? I mean, you're proposing a, a new policy that it's, uh, it has many novelties and, and many advantages. And of course, there are still limitations in the sense, I think nobody can really think about the silver bullet in migration policies, right? I mean, some migration policy that is going to spread the benefit and increase political support and benefit migrants. So uh, again, I, I think we should proceed by epsilon or, or, or incremental advantages over the current system. And in spite of these limitations, uh, I think this policy is, is way better than the systems that we have in place in most countries. Now, I'm a bit more worried about the, the third point I want to make here, which is also my last point. Uh, so you mentioned this many times during the, the, the presentation and also during the, the, the discussion by Gabriel, uh, that this is a model thought for temporary migration, right? So you imagine, you know, these workers moving from Mexico to the US working for a few months, or I don't know, maybe one year or two, and then going back. Uh, so this can work for Mexico, US migration, but it's probably more problematic um, when in, in all countries in which temporary migration is less viable option, right? So, uh, well, Gabrielle, she was discussing the case of France. I'm gonna discuss the case of Italy, of course. Uh, so, I mean, Italy, you know, receives lots of migrants from Northern Africa. I mean, these, these people, even if they enter legally in the country, uh, they would have a, they would face a very high cost uh, to go back to Africa, and and then again a cost or again they should wait uh, that they should you know participate uh, again into this auction in order to go back to Italy right so it, it's a uh, long and dangerous travel so my guess is that what they would do maybe they would enter legally through the system but then they would overstay the working permit which is already what they do now right so the, the big problem in italy uh, if you want to enforce migration is tourist visas right so we have a lot of tourism so we every year we issue a lot of these permits for uh, tourism and then people come and then they overstay their visas so i'm wondering how you could prevent uh, anything like that also in the case of uh, this policy but again uh, very nice uh, proposal overall and, and very nice paper. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Um, while people think of questions, um, maybe I'll give, I'll give Martin a chance to respond briefly. And then, and then if, if people have questions, because they please just write the word question in the chat. Uh, okay, I, I'd certainly like to hear any more comments or questions. Um, Gabriel and Paolo, terrific comments. Thank you very much. Um, I think this, I'm not going to go through individually. In fact, it'd be great if you could send me your, your PowerPoint and you can study some of this a bit more closely. Uh, one, one generic point I'd emphasize is, is you know, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of way of control, many ways of controlling this policy through the, the tax on work permits and through the eligibility requirements. Uh, we think that's important because, you know, we, we realize you're, you're stepping into, into a new terrain and um, you'd want to be careful no matter how much analysis and thinking you've done, um, the very fact that you guys can come up with the things that, that we have not thought about much or, or at all is indicative of that point. We think there are large, would be large potential gains from uh, creating this market, and it's, it, it would be huge. But we also think it would need to be managed. I'd emphasize also that um, I didn't, um, in the paper, we, we, we actually talk about a single unified market for, with one price of the work permit, and that's more expositional. It's, you could actually rewrite the model very easily with a, a differentiated work permit by skill level. 
um, which is a lot like the things that some countries have. My country, Australia, um, so you know they, they don't have the market for work permits, but they have a um, definitely have some prioritization of, of certain skills. Uh, Australia has a, a high skilled in migration, unlike France or the United States. Um, there's certain ways of, of you can do that. Um, it'll be straightforward. Um, well, you know, nothing straightforward, but but the conceptually reasonably straightforward to differentiate by skill or occupation. Um, and that could be particularly important, as I said, in countries like um, uh, Malaysia, which have sort of clear uh, occupational needs. Um, I think I, other points um, I have thought about or we could talk about, but uh, I, in the interest of time, I won't go into them. I think um, Misha... Martin, is, yeah, can I, can yeah, I make a... Yeah, please. Yeah, uh, hi, my name is Michael Lockshaw and co-author of this paper. I just want to very briefly... Uh, tell uh, my view on that is that, first of all, this is not a substitute for all the existing migration programs that exist in the country. It's an, another additional route through which the migration could work through. That's one thing. So we're not proposing at the limit to substitute everything with this single policy. All other policies are still exist. So if you think about US, the H1, H1B visa for high uh, quality workers will still will probably will still exist. It will not be substituting at least completely for that thing. Another point I want to make is like when you think about the problems uh, that our proposal creates, uh, in many ways it's the same problems that exist for other channels, enforcement, uh, making sure that people go back after they uh, stay on the term temporary visa. Again, think about US H1B visa. It's, it's more or less exactly the same situation. A, a person is giving a uh, temporary time to work in the country, after which he or she sh should go back. So that's, that's just uh, to, to, to put this framework around this. So that, these are my comments. Thanks. Um, I have a question from Ruhl. Uh, thank you, uh, Kevin. So I, I like the idea very much, uh, but I have a couple of questions on, uh, on the practical implication. Uh, because uh, suppose a resident uh, rents out a permit, um, how do you prevent this person from going into um, underground and do uh, you know work? Uh, well, what we call black work or something like that. How how could you prevent that? And second, um, I mean, poor people who uh, rent out their permit would probably get a lump sum of money. Um, many people in poor countries don't have bank accounts. So how do you, um, you know, what they, would they do, do with that money? And uh, you know, how do you prevent them from maybe spending all the money at once? Thank you. Okay, I have a, a question since there's nobody else right now. Um, um, just um, you started the presentation talking about the kind of terrible exploitation of of workers who are brought in by by agents. You know, I mean, I, I work currently in a jurisdiction where that's a, a big problem, you know, um, and I, I it's it's mostly low paid workers. And I suppose the reasons are that either they don't have the money to be able to afford the airfare to wherever it is they're going or they lack the information and the skills required just to match themselves to an employer. And so the, the agent is doing both of those things for them. So, I mean, in a sense, it's not a, a fair question because as Paolo says, there's no magic bullet, but um, you know, I wonder whether you know, those, those particular construction, Bangladeshi construction workers in, in wherever it is, I mean, I suspect they might still be ripped off by, by, by the agents under this proposal because it's not really going to be targeting them. Is that a fair comment? Um, well, actually, sorry, Alan. Um, Misha, do you want to come back on any of these? Either, either of these? Okay, yeah, I will, I, will, I will probably address something. So one thing, uh, and I think Paul will mention that, and it's a very important point that is often missed, that, for example, in the US, and this is what I'm learning uh, the same in, in, in Italy, the majority of illegal immigrants are not people who are crossing the border illegally, but it's overstayers. 
Now, imagine what's, the, what's happening in an overstaying situation. A person comes to the country, he actually a highly qualified person who can work in that country, but because he doesn't or she doesn't have a work permit, they overstay the visa and they end up working in a low skill occupations, which creates a lot of loss. So our proposal would allow these people who are still doing it right now to convert, to move from, you know, low skill occupations that are, they're doing illegally in a host country to illegal work in a higher skill occupation, paying high taxes, benefiting everybody in, in, in their society and even the, the, the people, the people in, in, in the uh, sending countries. So that's the thing. In terms of Bangladeshi workers, I think the uh, one of the proposals we have is that you can actually create a credit market on that, right? So uh, you can you can actually allow people who wants to travel to borrow uh, and 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 buy this work per permit condition on some uh, things, right? So for example, if if there is like already job waiting for them, they will be credit worthy and they, they can do that. Um, uh, about the poor people selling. Uh, uh, the work permits, uh, their work permits and, and bank accounts. Bank accounts doesn't seem to me uh, to be a super important issue in a sense because we're talking about rich countries. The citizens of rich countries will sell the work permit. You need to have a quite large gradient between the sending country and the host country in order to, to this market to be working. So in, in the rich countries, we assume the, the access to, to banking is quite high. Uh, you can also think about this as a, yeah, so, so people would receive this sum of money. Uh, you know, uh, our, I guess, common ideology is that people know better what to do with this money. Uh, so that's, I don't think government should regulate uh, that situation. But nevertheless, uh, there is a clearly uh, very strong instruments, and we show it in the uh, other paper, which is an empirical paper we're working on right now, is that through, through taxation on, on, on the work permit, government can regulate uh, the whole market very very efficiently, so it's it's not direct prohibition, but once you raise the taxes, you can regulate the size of the market. You can even regulate the position of the market. Thank you very much. Uh, Sophia has a question. Sophia Baran. Yes, yes. Thank you. Um, so maybe you already answered my question with this last point, but I was wondering. Uh, re this is related to Gabriel's question as well. That how would why would the amount of um, permits that are offered on the market, why would that be like the socially optimal one? And why would the price, like if the price, it, the price we imagine would be counter cyclical, right? It would be, it would be uh, low in bad times. And that's when we wouldn't want a high price. Wouldn't it be good to combine this with also the, the government or the state uh, offering these uh, fixed term work permits? And that way, you know, even people would still benefit who want to sell their work permits or rent them out, they would still benefit. So you would make it politically more palatable to sell these work permits, but the government would have a more direct way of regulating the quantity and the price, maybe. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, uh, kind of overall, the message is coming from, from our reviewers and from ourselves is that we are kind of for free market. We want to reduce market intervention. Uh, there's no limit on, on the amount of work permits, but at the same time, um, as I said, the taxation, putting taxes on, on, on the price of this work per permits could regulate this market very, very uh, efficiently. And you can, you can turn it down completely with extremely high taxes, so you can expand it. So that's, that's the answer. Uh, another point I want to make is that, uh, again, this is an option in addition to all existing options and combining this option with other existing in the country options would be completely feasible. And this is what we expect. We, we're not proposing dissolution. We're proposing the one of the options that could be put in the whole portfolio of measures to improve migration. And each country or even each locality should customize this portfolio to, to their needs. Yeah, I just add well, an observation to that, just to emphasize the role of the tax policy. It's not just the, obviously, the a number of total amount of migration, but it's also how you vary the tax with the business cycle. And that would be an obvious uh, policy response. Uh, and every government would see that quite quickly. If they're worried about uh, too many migrants coming in, they just raise the tax on the work permit. Thanks very much. Okay. Are there, are there any other questions?
We're, we're almost going once, going twice. <laughs> well, I think this is a pretty crowded kind of, I mean, lots of people have had the idea, you know, of that temporary migration is the way to square this kind of political economy circle that you're trying to square. But I, I you've actually managed to come up with an original idea that I, I had absolutely not heard before. So, so, so that is, that is admirable, I think. So thanks very much indeed. Well, thank you. And thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank All right. So, so, so that's the end of today's economic policy session, but you're all invited then to uh, the, 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 the special policy panel, uh, which is happening in 25 minutes. So it, it should be great. Marcus Brunemeyer, Anna Brayman and Adam Toos. So that's a real sort of star-studded lineup talking about climate change. So you're all very welcome to that. And we will reconvene tomorrow at 1300 uh, Brussels time. Uh, so thanks very much and see you tomorrow. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.